Wait, for such a short time. It seems like so much a short period time. I'm so blue bee da dee 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 da 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 dee da blue ba da da dee da da da. I'm blue. And now here's a little story about blue. Uh-huh. <laughs> and when your white balance is off and you don't have time to fix it before a show starts. At least you're not uh, all magenta. I think that would be worse. No, I hope I'm a calming influence on everyone this evening. Those are my hopes. <laughs> yes. I believe when I um when I did the show from a hostel in Israel that one time, I was blue for the entire broadcast as well. So yeah. I had a great white balance. To the best Some- of us. Yeah, it does happen. I, and, you know, my computer, something probably updated while I wasn't paying attention, which returned everything to its baseline poopiness. Uh, Blair's, and... Blair's slightly washed out tonight, and my autofocus is back on and yeah. going haywire. So, yeah, <laughs> back to normal. <laughs> and, and there we go. Adventures in video, everyone. Here hey. we go. Here we go. And, Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you. We are about... To begin our show, starting in, everybody ready? Mm-hmm. Starting in three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 674, recorded on Wednesday, June 6th, 2018, mooning about Pluto. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on This Week in Science, we are going to fill your heads with with what? With hosts, dating, and cucumbers. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. There are things that we know, and there are things that we do not know. We can, for a moment, condense the world into these two categories. Knowledge and the lack of it. But as we drill down, the picture can become murky. Of the things we do not know, there are things we know we do not know. We often refer to this as the unknown, like a mechanism for gravity, or what existed before the Big Bang, or where of where all of our missing socks have gone. There is another category of unknowns that are far more irksome. Unknowns that we think we know. Things that we think we know, but actually know nothing, or at least have noticeably wrong and what makes this most irksome is that most of human knowledge may actually fall into this category and while most of humanity gets by relying on knowing about things that they do not actually know about we will endeavor to keep you as much in the know of newly known things as your noodle can navigate for nothing makes us more knowledgeable as a species than this week in science coming up next The kind of mind that can't get enough I want to learn everything I want to fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I want to know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening? What's happening? This week in science. Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you, too. Justin, Blair, and everyone out there, welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back once again to talk about all the, all the news that we can fit in the show from the last week, for this week, for tonight. We got science. We have an interview. We've got all sorts of fun things going on. I had an alcoholic beverage tonight before the show, which is a little unusual, so it might be a little bit chattier than usual. We'll see how it goes. Okay. Tonight on the show, I'm a little blue. If you're watching on the video, I'm blue, but not because I'm sad, but because my white balance is off. That's all. On the show, I have lots of science news. I've got some dark matters. I've got some sterile neutrinos. And um, i got some other stuff in there. Justin, what do you have? Uh, let's see. I've got uh, two things science may have gotten wrong and three new reasons to fear the future. Three? That's that's limiting, so that's good. Great. All right, and Blair, what's in the animal corner? 
Oh, I have some tough guppies. I have uh, reasons to be protective of your mate. And I have the importance of a good cucumber. <laughs> Everybody likes a cucumber. And we also have an interview this evening with Dr. Jason Cook, who is joining us to talk about Pluto. But before we jump into the interview, I would love to remind everyone that if you have not yet subscribed to TWIS, you can do that. You really can. If you want to, go to twist.org for, for information, or you can look for This Week in Science, all the places that good podcasts and video podcasts are found. Okay. Jump it in. Let's do it. Let's jump right into this. Jason Cook, he is an, a planetary astronomer and research scientist. He focuses on the composition and atmospheres of icy bodies, such as Pluto, Triton, Charon, Kuiper Belt objects, comets, and other icy satellites. He uses spectroscopy, or the wavelengths of light, to learn about the composition of each object. And he received his PhD from Arizona State University and recently published a paper that used New Horizons data to investigate the moons of Pluto. Jason, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great to have you on. I know we have chatted back and forth many times about on, online about various astronomical issues, and you've always seemed like you know what you're talking about. So <laughs> Just great to, yeah, it's great to get you on here to talk about this thing that you do know about. All right. How did you get interested in, uh, in astronomy initially? Uh. So how did I get started? Um, so probably about when I was about 10 years old. So this is late 80s or so. Um, you know, Voyager 2 was encountering Uranus and Neptune. And I was a kid who liked to watch PBS, not just for like Mr. Rogers and, and Sesame Street, but uh, Nova specials or nature specials. Uh, I just kind of sort of ate, ate that sort of stuff up. And when the Nova specials came out on Uranus and Neptune, and then at the end, the whole um, grand tour of the solar system, that, that just brought me in. Of course, at the same time, Haley's Comet came by. Mm, uh, my, yeah. my grandmother um, sent my brother a telescope. And even though I was kind of too young to really know what was going on, it's just sort of like, it sat there in the corner for a few years. And then I was like, I'll start playing with that. And uh, I grew up in New York. And pretty much the brightest things you can see in the sky were Jupiter and Venus and Saturn. So yeah, I got hooked those far off objects in the solar system and the mystery yeah. that they provide. Yeah. Um, so is that what led you out to the, the distant icy reaches of our solar system? Is that like, is that you just started looking that distant and just kept, well, kept yeah. going? Uh, so as, as a kid, I always thought that, oh, Voyager, and, and I knew about Voyager hitting all the big planets. And I thought, well, obviously it's going to Pluto. <laughs> Why isn't no one talking about Pluto? Um, and of course, it didn't go to Pluto, and it, and only Voyager two was possibly planned, for, or Voyager one was possibly planned for that encounter, but they chose a Titan over Pluto. Mm -hmm. um, no regrets, of course, but um, you know, early '90s come around, and I I start reading about how there's always going to be a, there, there will be a mission for Pluto eventually, and these missions would pop up, and Congress would take the money, or somehow the mission would get killed. But I was always sort of like, okay, I want to be part of that sort of first time to encounter, a, of course, Pluto was a planet then, so I can say encounter a planet for the very first time, uh, see, see what it looked like up close, because in all our telescopes, it just looks like a bright point of light. Um, and you really didn't get much details out of it. Even with Hubble Space Telescope, even the largest telescopes on Earth didn't get much detail out of Pluto up until like uh, late 90s, early 2000s or so. Yeah. And so what, I mean, a couple of questions here. Let's start out with like what we did know about Pluto, this blob <laughs> floating out in space before we got these, you know, up close images from the New, Hori New Horizons mission. Like what, what did we know about it? Uh, we had a pretty good idea of how big it was. So at the time we said, oh, it's between um, 1150 kilometers in radius to 1200 kilometers in radius. And the ambiguity is because we knew it had an atmosphere. And we knew that because we'd watch stars go behind Pluto's atmosphere and that light would slowly dim out. If it had no atmosphere, the light would just turn off immediately and you'd know exactly how big it is. But because you see a star setting behind Pluto's atmosphere, you never knew exactly the, the right size. Yeah. Uh, we knew... I always, I, for some reason, I thought that the New Horizons mission had really given us that 
that concept of an atmosphere on Pluto. So we were we knew that ahead of yeah, time. We we actually knew quite a, quite a bit, but we okay. discovered a lot more with New Horizons. So yeah. we knew it had an atmosphere. We knew the surface was mostly nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane ices, which are all very volatile. So even at Pluto's temperature, surface temperature of forty Kelvin or uh, minus three seventy Fahrenheit or something like that. Um, these these ices will sublimate into a gas, which form the atmosphere, and it, the, the ices will then migrate from warm spots to cold spots on Pluto. Uh, we knew it had a very large moon, about ha half half the size of Pluto. That was Charon. Um, we knew where it was in the sky. We knew roughly its colors. So in astronomy, we used a lot of like these broad colors, like blue, a green, and red colors. Um, and sometimes those, just those basic physical values give us ideas of what what the composition is um yeah that, it was sort of basic stuff we knew we knew the atmosphere was relatively warm compared to the surface we didn't know exactly why it is um yeah <laughs> we knew there was a bright spot yeah so, didn't know what so, it was. yeah you've mentioned a bunch about so the the aspects of you know light i mean what we were what you're you, you're doing light-based telescope work right yeah, so it's yeah. these images so what exactly is spectroscopy and how does it use light to be able to tell us things like you know we can look at the ice the image of this blob right to the mm -hmm. to the untrained eye it looks like a blob of grays and whites in the sky but it really is this is methane and carbon and nitrogen and you know how do you how do you know that right I always, I always find this fun thing about astronomy is that all we can do is use telescopes to look at either reflected light or emitted light, you know, from stars. Um, and from that, we can determine the, the composition of stuff. So all, it's, all that spectroscopy does is it takes that light and breaks it up into a rainbow. Um, you know, we're all familiar with uh, seeing a rainbow because there's, there's rain on one side of, the, of your sky and the sun's behind it and the light goes through the light, uh, goes through the rain and makes the rainbow, rainbow pattern. Of course, there's a lot more than just the visible colors. There's the, the ultraviolet, which for us humans, it leads to our, our sunburns. Um, and then the, the infrared, which we, which we normally sense as heat, um, if we can see it you know, or feel it. Um, if you think of like a, an electric stove and it's really cold, you're turned off, the coils are dark. And as soon as you crank it on high, you'll see them start to glow red. So that's all the infrared light coming into the visible. Um, so I would always use infrared spectroscopy. So we're using this sort of weird range we can't see with our eyes. Um, usually inside of a telescope or inside the instrument, uh, there's a, a grating or something that sort of acts like a prism to break up the light. Um, and the grating, all that is, is just a, a piece of material with a whole bunch of grooves in it, and the light sort of scatters off of it onto a CCD chip, which today we all have in our, you know, in our phones. It's all modern cameras. Um, astronomers have been using that since the mid eighties or so. Um, uh, so you break it up into the light and what you get is a squiggly pattern in the end. And, and really you get, so you talk about seeing Pluto as a, as a gray blob to the untrained eye. What does it mean? Well, spectroscopy to the un untrained eye is a squiggly line. Um, <laughs> it, it really is. And, uh, it takes uh, a little bit of work, but you, you start to learn the patterns and stuff. So methane and nitrogen water all these every single molecule or compound uh, has a unique fingerprint so when the, so when the light goes through it or reflects off of it um, you get this sort of signature and you can determine the composition of everything from, from just the light itself and you can roughly get ideas of temperature uh, you can get ideas of how ices are mixed together uh, you can actually get a good good wealth of information it's really fun I think that that's amazing. Just it's matching patterns. And as it somebody is. in the somebody in the the chat room said, Kevin Unique, he says astronomy is just analyzing photons. Yes, I mean it's a little bit more and, than that. But <laughs> and we always we always joked in, in college and grad school, if you're an extra X-ray astronomer, and no offense to anyone out there who is, you really are just counting photons. <laughs> we're, we're, we have we have plethora in the in the infrared. Yeah, I bet. Yes. Okay, so. Now we know what you, what what you use to study, and we're talking about Pluto. So tell us a little bit about this actual study that you that you just published, or you, you, that you're getting published, and yeah. um, how you use the New Horizons data and what you found. Sure. So when New Horizons flew by in uh, July of 2015, 
you know, so uh, the, the Pluto system is sort of like a bullseye. Um, you don't just get to see one target each one at a time, you see it all at once. Um, and just by fortune of the alignment of the system, we got a very good close up view of Nix, which is one of the small satellites of Pluto. Uh, Hydra was not too close, but it's also kind of sort of same size as, as Nix. And then there were the two other smaller satellites, Kerberos and Styx. And for the sake of the mission, they decided not to go with making any observations of Styx because it was going to be way too far and way too tiny. Hmm. But they tried for Kerberos, and it was really difficult, but I was able to pull out uh, at least some sort of spectrum out of it. Um, so, it, it, so as it flew by, it took spectra of these uh, three different satellites, small satellites. And I can't say it's the very first time small satellites have been analyzed because Cassini has done a wealth of information at Saturn. Um, but for Pluto, um, a lot of the mission, a lot of the people designing the mission, designing the ob observations, really thought, well, we might not see anything at these small satellites. It might be too dark, and they might might be going too fast. So, uh, yeah, we, we got we got more than we expected with these things. That's cool. So, what did so what did you find? All right, <laughs> the fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, tell us the tell us so, the details. What well, are we learning? Yeah. So the what we what we pretty much knew was that they're going to be made of water ice. And that's what we first saw easily from uh, the, the three satellites that we looked at. Um, but what surprised us was that there was also a spectral signature of ammonia, or it wasn't pure ammonia, it's some sort of ammonia material or ammonia compound, um, but it was just sitting there at the right spot, the uh, right, right wavelength. Um, and it was, at least for me, I, 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 we knew it was on Sharon, we, and I thought it was somehow related to Sharon's formation and Sharon's past, but no way would it be seen on these small satellites because usually ammonia, when you mix it with water, you depress the, the freezing point of the, of the mixture from normally 273 Kelvin, and you can get down to 176 Kelvin if you get the right mixture. And this is the whole idea that you have cryovolcanic activity. Now, that's not to say these small satellites have them. They're way too small, though, completely frozen out. But why do you have it on these small satellites? That's sort of still the open question. <laughs> because yeah, ammonia it, itself would get destroyed very, uh, but 20 million years or so. What produces ammonia in the first place to have it, to have these compounds? I mean, it's, it, why, what would make it be there? Well, uh, the idea is that ammonia is part of the formation of the solar system. So as we okay. we're looking at these things and we see ammonia, it's, it's, some, it's a remnant of our solar system formation. Um, the idea was that ammonia should have been seen at Saturn, like in great abundances. Back, people thought this in the, uh, I'd say up until the 90s or so, 1990s. Um, but as observations got better, we really weren't seeing it at Saturn. Although we, we do see small traces of it now, you know, using Cassini data. Um, but when, since we didn't see it in big abundances with telescopes, then they said, oh, maybe it's at Uranus, and we don't see it there. Well, oh, maybe it's at Neptune, we don't see it there. And so we've chased it all the way out, but now we are seeing it at Pluto, and we're seeing it in, you know, Pluto's part of the Kuiper Belt. So we're we're getting ideas that maybe it should be on other Kuiper Belt objects as well. And, and some astronomers have definitely see, have published papers saying it's suggestive it's here. We think it's here. So uh, there's it's certainly we're we're starting to put this this puzzle piece together a little bit. So is it that these larger gas giants that they're just big sis, uh, big systems of their own that they've got so much. Uh, there's so much dy dynamic volatility in the, you know, in their magnetic fields, their gravitational fields, everything that the, that the ammonia, the ammonium compounds have been either broken down or they've floated off into space. Yeah. So what I, what I mentioned earlier is that, that ammonia itself would, under normal UV conditions, would break yeah. down in 20 million years, 25 million years, even at Pluto or, right. at, uh, right. or at Sharon's distance. Something has kept it there. Yeah, so the reason we don't see that at all the other satellites in our solar system, yeah, it could be that it was destroyed. It might not have formed there. Um, our idea of how the solar system formed is that it probably didn't form in the same way we see it today. Planets do migrate. Um, so if, it, if the, the conditions weren't right where the planets formed or the, and the satellites formed, then they, they lost or never attained their, their, their ammonia abundance, and they probably have a more of a nitrogen uh, Enrichment and two. Could it also suggest that uh, somehow Pluto's picked up this 
uh, among in, in in from a from a passerby in the not too distant past? Um, it's hard to tell when you have one object to study, right? So we there's a handful of other objects like uh, a KBO called Orcus. Um, some people thought Quarwar was one of them, but others have said no. There's there's definitely methane there. And methane and ammonia have a special feature almost directly on top of each other. So mm. separating the two is really, really tricky. Um, it may be in the Haumea system as well. Uh, I think more observations need to be done there. So we're really just, we're just starting to scratch the surface with knowing why is there ammonia on Pluto, not elsewhere. Or maybe it is elsewhere and we just haven't found it yet. Um, certainly the, 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 the follow-up flyby of, of 2014 MU69, which will take place in less than seven months from now. Uh, we'll get close-up observations and we'll hopefully, I would hope to see ammonia there too, but no guarantees. Right. And this is the next object that New Horizons is aimed at. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It doesn't have a nickname yet. Do we have to go with the letters and numbers? <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I don't know how official it is, but there are definitely people calling, calling it um, Ultima Thule. I think that's how you pronounce it. Ultima and, Thule. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's right. Right. I, hope, I hope it didn't butcher it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now, but, but Pluto, as you pointed out, was a planet. Then we figured out that it wasn't a planet. And, and now <laughs> we're going to tie you into the debate. <laughs> haven't we also, haven't we recently discovered that it's not a, it didn't even form like a regular planet would. It, it's, isn't this now, aren't we talking about a, a cluster of comets that got together and decided to become a planet, but then decided. Their orbit. <laughs> yeah, we should all just bind together. Yeah, there was a study that came out like in the last week and a half or so. We reported on it last week that this idea that it's a, you know, a, a, a billion comets, mm -hmm. the mass of a billion comets that came together. Um, I don't know about that one. I haven't, I haven't really read that myself, but um, <laughs> certainly Pluto is. Uh, the the kingmaker or the, the kingpin of the Kuiper belt. As far as we know, it's the largest object. It beats out Eris by 20 kilometers or so, not, which is not much, but it does seem to, at least as far as we can tell, beats it out. It also um, doesn't have the proto-molecule. -mo That's good. Sorry. Expanse okay. references. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there may be other objects out there in the Kuiper belt which are larger than Pluto, but we haven't found them yet. And the whole idea of a planet nine um, is is great in theory, but um, really lacks the det detection, which hurts <laughs> hurts the theory, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, I yeah. think the uh, the interesting thing that came out of that particular study is first this idea that it's you know it it is similar to other planets, except that instead of more rocky dust material like the inner planets, that this is more was co more cometary material so it's got more of the the um outer solar system ices and and whatnot that was floating around yeah. out there and that it didn't come from the inner solar system which what i'm thinking is that this story from last week kind of jives really well with your paper and the presence of the ammonium compounds because yeah. like you said if it had come from the inner solar system and then migrated out you wouldn't have found the ammonium compounds right. most likely, and the and their their concept wouldn't have worked. So it's kind of like your papers are. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Definitely. And we see comets that come in from the Oort cloud or from pretty far away out, out there. Mm -hmm. They do have a lot of um, a lot of the the compounds we see on Pluto: nitrogen, uh, methane, and carbon monoxide. They they tend to dominate out in the outer solar system. So when a comet comes in, like uh, Hale Bopp did in the late '90s. Um, we, we pick up these, these gases, you know, leaving the comet. Of course, comets are, you know, a few kilometers big. Hellbop was one of the exceptions to being a large comet. I think it was 20 kilometers, 40 kilometers. Um, and Pluto, of course, then is much bigger. But the whole idea of exploring MU69 is to, to compare comets to Pluto to uh, everything in between. You know, we want to get a sample of everything. It's hard to get to send spacecraft to all the all the objects, although that would be a, such a dream. <laughs> yeah. Um, do they have spectroscopic data from the Rosetta mission to uh, the comet? Uh, what is it? 67P Garimov, Gar Garimov, 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 Garimov,
it's a tongue twister. I know. Um, I'm always like, how do I say this? Yeah. Uh, there's there's definitely a spectrum of that. Um, so I so as that mission was going on, my office mate at the time, he was part of the Rosetta mission, and he worked with the Alice instrument that was the UV spectrograph on on Rosetta. So there's definitely information about uh, spectra which we can compare to the comets to Pluto, because Pluto uh, New Horizons also had an Alice instrument, a, a UV spectrograph, uh, built by the same people. So. Nice. Right, so you you can have direct comparisons of yes. the different these different solar bodies. So, so in terms of Pluto and its status, not as a planet these days, what is its status? I mean, we're we're discovering all this amazing stuff, and from the public's perspective, and where where I hear people talking, or because they get excited about what's coming out of the New Horizons mission and the data that's coming back. You know, people. You know, people want to argue that Pluto should still be a planet because it seems it's a it's a dominant feature in that outer mm -hmm. in the outer solar system. Um, I always think of its status as awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is what it is, right? So right. There, are those, there are those people who want to say it's a planet, it's a planet, and there's those people who say it's a it's a dwarf planet. But wait, uh, wait, wait! That has planet right in the there in the name. Yeah. So, yes. You know, like some are gas planet, planet, some are rocky planet, planet. So then it's a planet. If they're going to call it planet, then I think we're fine calling it a planet still. It it, <laughs> it still it still fills the or is it's still part of the planetary bodies in our solar system. Yeah, I um, I think that, that we, not, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong in this, but it feels like nobody really made an effort to get rid of it as a planet until other objects started getting found and named and people wanted to include them as planets like like was it was it the uh, uh xeno warrior princess planet and then oh, there was like, yeah. yeah they started to like want to keep adding and then people were getting to name them and then it would have just been too many planets so we had to so stop what? it somewhere <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah. you have a planetary system that has a thousand planets that would be pretty okay. awesome <laughs> That would be hard to memorize. It would be hard to memorize. That would be a lot of acronyms or something. Right. Your yeah. mnemonic is pretty intense for that. <laughs> so I have to ask, um, kind of with all this study of Pluto and and um, and the wealth of knowledge that you know, obviously this is probably the thing that keeps coming up is Pluto. Is it a planet? Pluto's a planet. Pluto's not a planet. That's kind of the headline. I think that's the thing that people think about first when you hear Pluto. After that, probably that picture of Pluto with the heart on it um, from the New Horizons mission. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. if there was one thing that you could make sure everybody knew about Pluto, if it's your favorite kind of fact or thing that you'd want to cue in a conversation about Pluto, what is that thing that you love to talk about? Uh, besides being awesome? <laughs> Yeah. That's, yeah. What makes it yeah. awesome, I guess, um, in a nutshell? I think in a way it it's unique, but it's also not the only one like itself. I mean, so it has the, like you mentioned, the heart on there. Like we, we never thought we'd see, uh, well, we, we knew when we were aiming there that we we're going to this bright spot. We didn't know it was going to be shaped like a heart, uh, so it's, a, <laughs> it's pretty nice. Um, but it's sort of basically a polar cap on the equator of Pluto, which is bizarre. That's super um, weird. And then we know that Triton, which is Neptune's largest moon, was a captured object from the Kuiper belt. And it's about the same size as Pluto. And yet its surfaces doesn't have this big ice cap on the equator. Uh, it does have these nice uh, geysers that go off and left all those, uh, these black streaks that, new, that uh, Voyager 2 had seen. We don't see them as same details on, on Pluto, but there's some hints maybe something similar happened, has happened on Pluto, but Pluto has these weird seasons that go on that, um, you, know, it, you know, we can think of seasons being roughly one Earth year, you know, like how we experience them, but then over millions of years, Pluto goes through these different seasons where the, the tilt changes and there are regions of Pluto which never experience a polar night. And so there's this dark black, uh, dark band around Pluto, which, Basically, all the ices have been baked away from, um, but then there's the heart sitting right on top of that that terrain. So, bizarreness. Um, and who knows what Eris looks like? Eris sits right in the same family as Triton and Pluto, same size, same co composition, but doesn't seem to have an atmosphere. Um, we, so, so it's that Pluto and their family 
super weird, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. They're, they're, they're all like second cousins five times removed or something. It, they're like, yeah, we're related, but we don't talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think it's so fascinating to have these objects that, you know, we, you know, it was almost luck that that Pluto was found when it was found and and now to be actually exploring it. And like you said, discovering it has these features that we never expected. You know, I, I, I am entranced by the, the icy cliffs. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. these sheer icy cliffs that you can imagine just coming up out of nowhere on the. Yeah. On the there, sea. there, there's one that, uh, so when we were first getting the first bits of data coming down and we were just, you know, I don't know if, how much of the story you've heard is that the data came down to a very, very uh, like weak, uh, slower than dial-up speed. Mm. Um, yeah. And so we were just getting just little bits during the time of the encounter. And the first, one of the first images that came down were, were, were these giant mountains. And we said, oh my goodness, these mountains are huge. They, you can't have mountains made out of nitrogen. It's just too, it's a softer ice. So we knew right away we found water ice, but though we could, didn't have the spectroscopic signature for water ice. Um, and then we saw regions uh, called uh, Virgil Fossa, which then stood out as being enriched in water. And it's just, just this sort of this weird crack that goes along Pluto and there's water just sitting there. Um, water on Pluto is unlike Triton. Triton has water all over the place. Water on, on Pluto is just in these limited small spots. And we trying to understand that is also part of, part of the job of playing with all this data. Yeah, what's your favorite moon? Uh, Sharon, yeah. I, I'll pick Sharon. I'll I'll just say it right now. <laughs> it's sure. it's big and it's it, it's got interesting um, features of its own. You, you said something in, in, intriguing there a while back. Um, there may be larger than Pluto objects out there. Well, the whole idea of of Planet Nine that that thing right. was. I think some people think it's I don't know so many so many times bigger than the Earth or so. Um, but is there a chance that we've got like other undiscovered uh, Pluto size or larger than Pluto objects out there in our solar system? Still, it seems like we've been, I feel like we've been looking for a long time, <laughs> but then I'm like, well, yeah, space is big and l- lighting has to be right. And right. You know, it, it's not as easy as just having one telescope pointed towards the sky. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of different surveys that have happened and are, and are going on right now. So they'll look at, um, places along what's called the ecliptic, where a lot of all the planets are lined up, um, and they'll, they'll they'll pick a point out in space, and they'll just sit there and stare at it, or they'll come back months later to see what objects might have moved. And to the best of our knowledge, you know, we've only cataloged something like fifteen hundred actual Kuiper Belt objects, um, and they've they've covered roughly the whole three hundred sixty degree um, length of it. But of course, the the longer you're exposed, the deeper you can go. Um, right. Nothing has really turned up that's bigger than Pluto. Um, Eris was obviously one of these objects that, that turned up, and they said, oh, it's bigger, and then they realized, no, it's not. <laughs> and so, Kiki, you were talking about this object, uh, I think a week or two ago, that's going the opposite way. It's the retrograde. It's going in the other direction. Yes. Are those objects tougher to spot because they're going the other way? Like, yeah. could there be a bunch of them, but just because we've been tracking our telescopes and it's whizzing by the other direction, we just didn't see it? Uh, yes. So what... what <laughs> So, you know, when you're looking in the ecliptic, you're only favoring objects that are going in the direction of the ecliptic, objects which are going up or down. You only have a small period of which you're going to see that object. So while we know of objects which go retrograde or have high inclinations, um, we only have a small number in our database just because they're rarely seen. So it's Um, not necessarily that they're... I mean, that super rare that we're... There's only, like, this one that we saw seems like such an anomaly... It just might be that uh, they're so much harder to see that there's there's a lot of them out there and we're gonna yeah. find them with time. Yeah, yeah, it'll take time. And I, I, the estimates for how many KBOs that are out there, you know, run in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of wow. objects. Of course, it depends on how small an object gets because, um, you know, we're finding objects like MU69, which is 25 kilometers big. Um, there's, they've certainly found smaller objects than that, but, you know, let's say they find one kilometer objects. It's probably thousands. Of, you know, the numbers of them increase exponentially. The smaller you go, right? 
Yeah, I mean, we we still, I mean, asteroids come to our planet. There was the story this last week of an asteroid, a well, meteor once it hit Africa, but we only noticed it like a very brief window of time before it actually impacted the planet. Right. It was like hours ahead of time. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. When, what, I, I don't know if it was that, that asteroid or, or meteorite, um, but someone had compared an object that was found to the size of a king-size bed mattress. Yeah. I thought, wow. oh, this is what we're getting down to. We're comparing to mattresses. <laughs> that's, that's pretty vivid, though. I kind of get that. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> now I just have an image of a king-size bed flying through the air. <laughs> yeah, but maybe maybe they folded it up, folded it up into the size of a mini fridge, you know, like yeah. in the that, mattress another... commercials on podcasts. No, Here sorry. Space futon. <laughs> that's right. Space futon. Oh my goodness, this is a good cartoon right so here. I know what I need. I need to get a telescope and just start, just start tracking the opposite direction of everything else that's moving, which I probably did the first time I picked one up, and that's why I, I was very ineffective see, with it. But I, if I stuck with it, I could have discovered one of these mystery, these these well, hidden objects. At that point, you need a very large telescope. <laughs> right, and, and so, so speaking of large telescopes, you know, Hubble is seeing far 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 away right it's seeing these amazing pictures but i mean every once in a while we 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 focus it on focus it closer to home on our own solar system i mean why isn't hubble finding these things for us it's got the best cameras <laughs> well it did find mu69 for us okay there we go so you know right. a whole part of the mission was we, we were going to go to pluto and the extended part of the mission was to go to a kuiper belt object and we always knew during the fly time to get to pluto there's going to be a team that looks for uh, yes. the Kuiper Belt object. Yeah. And they tried from the lar largest telescopes on Earth, um, Keck, Subaru, Gemini. They tried year after year and really just could not find a good suitable target. And it came down to um, 2014. And it was like, we got to hurry up and find something. And they made yeah. a deal with, with, um, with uh, Hubble Space Telescope saying, look, give us a little bit of time. And if we can find, we think we should at least find so many objects in a small window if we do, would you give us this bigger window? And we found uh, the right number of objects. They gave us the bigger window. And then we didn't find as many in the bigger window. <laughs> and, and luckily, uh, you know, and then we whittled down from five targets down to two. One which would burn all the fuel, but might have been a bigger object, I think it was. And then the one that would give us a, a more reserved fuel, but a smaller object. And right. so we went for the, the reserve fuel and smaller object. So Hubble is basically like my 11-year-old when I forget my glasses. I think that it's an interesting point that comes out of this, though, is that, you know, we think of this, you know, looking at space and everything is that it's like this very concerted effort by the space community to find these things and do these missions. But really, it's a bunch of different teams who are all fighting for time for their own missions on very limited amount of uh, of, of really good equipment. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a there's definitely a an oversubscription rate to to telescopes as well as trying to get grant money yeah. um, that just makes it very a, a difficult field to to work through. So is that, you're making it sound like we need a, another Hubble up huh. there. I think like, they're doing that. We had, I think they're working on that. <laughs> we had a second one. That would free up a lot of the, that wait list. For, for some reason, the military had two Hubbles sitting in storage and said, here you go, NASA. We don't want these anymore. Oh, nice. And so NASA is putting the, the W first telescope up. Um, I, I don't know when. It's a couple of more years, I think. Um, and, of course, James Webb is going up. Mm -hmm. um, in, uh, oh, I think the launch date switched, slipped from 2019 to 2020. but. It keeps slipping. Yeah. Well, you know, as, as long as the slipping is shorter and shorter each time, then right. you get closer. And, and the, uh, the the Webb telescope is going to be an infrared telescope. That's a, yeah, it's a very specialized so, machine. So it's going to be great for your for your spec infrared yes. <laughs> data catching. You're going to have a stream it, of amazing data coming down to work with. It's probably going to return a lot of spectra of Kuiper Belt objects um, for people like me to play with. <laughs> That's exciting. So that's got to be exciting. So you've got a couple of things that are, you've got the the rest of the New Horizons mission that is going to be bringing data from from ultra, ultra awesome. Ultra. And, <laughs> Ultima Thule. 
there we go. Also a Thule and, uh, and also the James Webb scope, which will be eventually bringing you new stuff. Are there any other projects that you are uh, working on? Any, anything that you're excited about? Uh, well, I'm just excited about anything that, I, that, that, that funds me. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, there, there's still so much more data out there with Cassini data. Um, and the idea that, I, you know, comparing Cassini results with New Horizons results, because they were, they were both had like top line instruments uh, for the times they were built. Um, uh, Voyager 2 didn't have a, a, an infrared spectrograph because that was too, too far advanced for the late early 70s, I guess, when they were that building is. it. Yeah. Um, but Cassini and, and of course, Juno is going on around Jupiter. So that, that, and that just got its extension to 2021, I think it is. Yes. So yeah, more Jupiter going on. Um, and there's, there's always talks amongst the community about getting back to Uranus, getting back to Neptune with, I, I would hope, a Cassini-like mission where you're sitting there for, you know, they say, oh, we'll go there for two years and you end up being there for 15. Um, right, I mean. And of course, I'm, a Pluto orbiter mission is definitely in, in the, in the, in the works. Mill. Yeah, in the, in the works. And then, yeah, and there's the, uh, there the people are pushing for Europa. Yes. Right. Yeah, Europa is now, is now capturing everyone's attention because it is, is, is an ocean world, it has cryovolcanic activity. Is there life there? Um, right. And that's the one where they want to build the, build the new uh, Sandals Resort, right? It's Europa. <laughs> oh, I, don't, I hope it has a lot of radiation shielding. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. <laughs> Oh, there's so many places to go and things to look at in the universe. Thank, but yeah, thank goodness that we have have our telescopes and are figuring out these tricks of looking at the light to actually mm -hmm. bring them closer to us in the meantime and before we can actually, in that meantime, between now and when we can actually get there. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, Jason, if people want to follow you and your 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 astronomy and planetary science exploits online how can they do that um i'm usually on twitter at astro cook um i i tend to use it here and there but definitely when i go to meetings that then i then i fire that thing off <laughs> it's usually pretty active um that's that's my main outreach to, to the to the world i guess nice and your paper is going to be coming out in uh which journal do you icarus. Know it's, a, icarus. it's a big planetary journal um I will, I'll probably also post a version, uh, a, almost a nearly finished version of it online so people can grab that and, and uh, look at that nicely. <laughs> cool. So if people are interested in taking a look at your ammonia data, then they can. That'll be fantastic. So we are going to take a quick break right now. We've got some, some things to tell those of you who are listening. I'll be back after the break with a bunch more stories i've got i've got physics we've got ghost particles we've got dark matter i think justin you've got some fun things and blair has dark-eyed guppies and cucumbers 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 <laughs> <laughs> and jason if you would like to stick around for the uh the, the second part of the show please do so and if if not feel free to hang up <laughs> <laughs> if you're like, I'm done here. <laughs> no, I think I'll stick around. Awesome. Great. All right. So we're going to take a quick break, everyone. This is This Week in Science, and we will be back after these messages with more science. Stay tuned. <laughs> Explain things you've heard more than intuition. The libraries that shows the way to go. New conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us this week on This Week in Science. We are so glad to have you here, whether you are listening to us right now or whether you're watching us on YouTube or watching us on Facebook. Thank you for being here and enjoying the science. We hope that you are enjoying, have you, that you have enjoyed all this information about Pluto for the last little bit. We have lots more coming up. But for right now, those of you who are enjoying the show, if you would like to you want to help us out and keep this show going week after week after week and also if you want to show your love for twists in all its all its glory 
There are lots of ways that you can do this. First of all, head on over to twist.org. Twist.org is our website and uh, it's basically the portal to all things twist. Head over to twist.org and you'll be able to find the most recent episodes in addition to a nice little button to subscribe. So if you have not yet subscribed to us on YouTube, on iTunes or Google Play, whichever of these uh, platforms work for you, go ahead and do it. Why the heck haven't you? You need to do that right now. Subscribe to us so that you know about us and can listen to us or watch us week after week after week. Additionally, if you are interested in, in uh, like I said, sharing your love of twists, a great way to do that is with a twist shirt or a mug, maybe a mouse pad. I mean, somebody comes over and looks at your computer and goes, what's this? Twists? And then you can explain it to them. There are also nice polo shirts that you can use in our Zazzle store. Zazzle is a place where uh, you we have put a bunch of our a bunch of merchandise with our logo all over it so that you can enjoy it and you can share your enjoyment of twists with the world. We also have a bunch of art objects that come from Blair's Animal Corner calendars from the past few years. Things like a mammoth lumbar pillow. I mean, that's pretty fantastic. We've got wrapping paper with rats. Rat ratting paper? No, wrapping paper. There's also little baby onesies, all sorts of fun things. And all of the proceeds, not all of the proceeds, a portion of the proceeds go back to support this show. So you support us financially as well as enthusiastically. Also, if you head back over to twist.org, there are other ways to support us financially and to keep this show going. You can click on the yellow donate button on the sidebar that will take you to a PayPal interface that will let you donate whatever amount you want. And it's a nice, nice way to show your love to, of Twist. Another way that you can uh, donate through PayPal is to click on any of the recent episodes, scroll on down through the show notes while you're listening to the show on the page, and click on the pink buttons at the bottom of the episode pages. Those pink buttons will allow you, again, to donate through PayPal, but this time in a recurring fashion. So you can set it and forget it and just know that you are supporting us in a fabulous way. Another platform that we use is Patreon. And if you haven't heard of it, Patreon is a crowdfunding platform uh, that that a lot of podcasts and creators use. And in this platform, you can choose your level of support for that you'll be charged once per month. So we have from $1 a month to $10 a month to $1,000 a month. Who wants to who wants to support us at the $1,000 level? That would be fantastic. Help us live our dreams of creating all sorts of science content for you. You can help us do it by clicking on these levels of support. Become a patron over on Patreon and help us keep this show going week after week after week. Help us pay all our bills. Help us make sure we can keep these really bright lights on. That's what we like. That's what we like. So everyone out there, we thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for your support. Thank you. We really could not do this without you. Hmm. I've been running this pot. Oh, that's an old thing. That's the wrong thing. I'm going to make another thing happen right now. <laughs> And we're back with more This Week in Science. Oh, yeah. We are back again, and we have more science. But first, oh, yeah, it is time for favorite section of the show. <coughs> this week in What Has Science Done for Me Lately? Lately. Okay. This week, our letter comes from Melissa Hall. Melissa Hall writes in and says, what has science done for me lately? It might not be the positive story, but I thought I'd send it anyway. Now some time has passed. However, science allowed my vet to conduct the biopsy of my cat's lesion on his tongue to complete the histopathology to give me the information to know his diagnosis and to know what treatment was possible and what was futile. This allowed me and my vet to provide the right care to my cat and not put him through unnecessary chemotherapy for a tum tumor known, thanks to research, to not respond to this. 
Science allowed me to research this inoperable tumor and ask my vet about a treatment with a small study showing positive results. Although small, the main thing was the limited negative side effects, and we went ahead. Nutrition studies gave me the right diet to keep him healthy. The years of study of my vets allowed them to know when this was not working, and the science of euthanasia allowed me to give the gift of release from pain in a comfortable environment. Overall, science has let me know I was able to do all I could and use all the knowledge of all the professionals involved to give a voice to my cat. Melissa, thank you so much for writing in. As a cat owner and a cat lover, uh, I mean, and any pet owner, I think, could agree. And, and I, think this, I think this story even extends beyond pets. I mean, this is yeah. this is also a thing with humans. Like, there's a there's a <laughs> lot of the the knowledge that we have now, the, the the database of what works and what doesn't work, and what treatments can can cause what side effects over time. You know, we can have a a a more patient choice and an informed choice when making these health decisions so that we don't, as could have been the case here, go right into a dramatically excruciating uh, treatment that has no, uh, as we now know, uh, positive outcomes. Right. Yeah. So science and the professionals who study it, who use it, that knowledge, it's, it is something that definitely does affect some people very specifically in certain instances, but it does affect all of us every day. Melissa, thanks once again. Everyone out there, remember this section is all about you. Tell us your stories. Tell us how science affects you today, yesterday, lately. Leave us a message on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash This Week in Science, or you can email me at Kirsten, K-I-R-S-T-E-N, at This Week in Science. Dot com. We want to keep filling this segment of the show with your stories. So please write. All right. You guys ready for some ghosts? Ooh. Ooh. I don't know. That's scary. Ghosts. Ghosts. Wait, what are we talking about ghosts for? This is a science show. Yeah. Oh, what because... are you talking about, Kiki? <laughs> oh, the ghost in the machine. Maybe. Ghost machines? This is even worse than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is a story about neutrinos. So neutrinos, there are three of them in the standard model. There are three neutrinos that we are aware of, that we have found. And there has been some evidence that suggests that there might be a fourth kind of neutrino, but the standard model of physics doesn't predict a fourth neutrino. Now, the interesting thing about neutrinos is they kind of like flip-flop. They're constantly, like, they want to be somebody else. And so they're always switching from one flavor of neutrino mm. to another. They're like, I want to be vanilla. No, I'm going to be chocolate. No, I like strawberry. And they're constantly flipping between these different flavors of neutrino. And it's because of this flipping that they, you can kind of, researchers know an estimate of the proportions of what kinds of neutrinos they should get when they're doing experiments like on, you know, on, um, on linear colliders or other things where they're smashing things into each other or when they're actually creating energy beams that would be creating neutrinos. They, they know what they're starting with and then they, they have an idea of what they should be finishing with based on their understanding from the standard model of physics, which has worked really well so far. Now this new, uh, new study, there have been a couple, like I said, there have been a couple that suggest there might be a fourth what's called sterile neutrino sterile which is it doesn't have a charge it's not it's it's like kind of a, a it's a blank yeah it can't have it. babies <laughs> <laughs> exactly it's a neutrino with no flavor okay <laughs> so a ridge plain yeah and so this but this sterile neutrino like i said not predicted by the standard model of physics however there is a new experiment that just came out in the mini boon detector and this is at Fermilab in Illinois, Batavia, Illinois. And it uh, measures neutrinos that originate from protons that hit a source. 
and it's a it's got there's a kind of oil and the the pro these these protons are shot out of the source and they hit this big ball of oil and they create these flashes of light which are the neutrinos and these they can be these flashes of light can be red and the types of flashes of light tell them what kind of neutrinos are there and then they found out that they had a lot more electron neutrinos in their measurement than they expected and they were like oh why should this be and looking through all of their all of their equipment and everything they're like well it, we don't think it's background noise we don't think this is a mistake we think this is real and we think this is a sterile neutrino and if we add our experimental evidence to this other experiment, both of our experiments become more significant. Our results become stronger together. And so a bunch of people in the physics community are excited about this. That said... Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and some people are angry, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, there are some people who are like, well... Let's talk about this for a minute. And in fact, according to a um, a blog that uh, was written by Tommaso Dorigo, who is a particle physicist with Italy's National Institute for Nuclear Physics in Padua, um, he says these excess events, they pile up in like one area of the detector's energy range, this low area. And that's the same area where a lot of background noise from other particles piles up too. And so he's thinking, oh, maybe you just mistook background noise from other particles for a sterile neutrino. Or, or maybe, drawing board. maybe they've been seeing these things in every experiment in this, in this range and just assumed it was noise. Like, like how do you... Mm. I know this. I mean, this is. I I think this is like you know. Let's uh, Jason talking about spectroscopy. We're talking about a a, a, mm -hmm. a particular pattern, right? They're looking at an ener energetic pattern in the data, and they're saying there's there's a predominance of signal here, and this is kind of. I mean, it's kind of like spectroscopy in a weird way. It is, yeah, <laughs> and. Uh... Sometimes it's hard to know if you're going to mistake noise for something that is actually a result of something else. Um, you know, we do our best to try and understand the errors or, you know, the errors in our measurements, you know what the sources are and, and what might be real and what might be false. It's not always easy. But that's, no. that, especially for those detectors, they have to sleuth out any sort of sources of particles, whatever. <laughs> I know. And, and, and in this particular case, so I, you know, there's, there's the the kind of popular idea of like, you know, the the physicists of today, these astrophysic physicists, they want something beyond the standard model. <laughs> and so they're like, yes, something not predicted by the standard model. And everybody gets excited about it. But I kind of think this is like this is the uh, the, the the requirement is if you have an extraordinary uh, what is it? Extraordinary. You, you need you, an extraordinary result requires extraordinary evidence. You know, if you have this thing, they have they have to go back and prove um, why. So there's another aspect from the uh, Science Magazine article on this story. Um, they should have found a, different numbers of these neutrinos also in the cosmic microwave background radiation, and so an early CMB background study uh, kind of had room for the sterile neutrino. The Planck data, which is the most accurate data to date on the cosmic micro microwave background radiation, has no room, no room for sterile neutrinos. So they're going to have to come up against um, some very significant data uh, that's related to the actual formation of our universe. Yeah, actually, and I've got a story coming up a little bit later that actually pits Planck against some other uh, other observations locally in terms of the expansion of the universe, which is sort of interesting. Mm -hmm. So that is so, interesting. So there is there is this, and, and it's also a push to go away from the standard model, which yeah. kind of disagrees with Planck, just like this story is. Um, 
And it is fascinating. Like, I, like, how can you not root for something other than the standard model just because of how, like, ridiculously cool it would be to have this, this, this new discovery and, and, and the things that it can unlock? I Although mean, it's tough because time and time again, you know, it seems like it's. I don't know. I kind of like that. I mean, yes, it's neat to have un unexplained stuff and things that aren't predicted. And oh my gosh, let's go back to the drawing board and have these alternative theories. But at the same time, how amazing that we have a model of the universe yeah. that works for just Pretty about cool. everything. I mean, this is Pretty cool. Uh, yes, let's Why keep are you trying, trying to, look to it break up, it. Guys? Jeez. No, let's let's keep trying to break it. But I think. The strength of the standard model is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. It explains stuff. We can do <laughs> things because of it. Uh, moving on, let's talk about other universal things. Dark matter. Oh. The dark matter that's out there that t makes up a bunch of the universe that we've never seen, except for we've kind of seen its gravitational effects, but we've never actually discovered what makes it up, right? It's dark. It doesn't interact with normal matter and it doesn't doesn't react with light so we're just kind of like we can't see it what's going on it's the explanation for everything we can't explain as probably dark matter it's the fudge factor right but yeah. it's not a fudge factor it's there's something going on what is going on uh and so some physicists have been you know lots of physicists are trying to explain what dark matter is and how it works. Um, and so uh, according to an Ars Technica article earlier this year, a project called Edges was taking the universe's temperature about the time that stars were first starting to form. Um, but the matter in the universe, baryonic matter, was cooler than expected. And the what people conclude from the data is that there must have been something else there to basically speed the cooling up, to absorb the energy of the universe so that it cooled down faster, right? And so dark matter is a prime suspect in this particular situation. But because it doesn't interact with baryonic matter in the right way, how would it do that? How would it actually say, here, let's bounce around together and I'll take your vibrations and vibrate more and we'll, we'll cool down the universe a little bit. You know, how is that going to happen? So New paper out, physicists are proposing that dark matter is not just a single type of particle as we have been thinking, that maybe it's kind of like an atom with a bunch of subatomic dark matter particles. And that if it has a bunch of little particles that kind of uh, clump together and interact with each other, that maybe some small proportion of those dark matter particles would be charged, electrically charged, which would allow some amount of interaction. And they calculate that maybe 1%, so really tiny fraction of the dark matter in the universe, but maybe 1% of these dark matter particles would be electrically charged. And, allow, and that, according to their calculations, would have taken care of that cooling during the early universe. Hmm. But we still don't know because nobody's actually seen it. <laughs> we still don't know. But um, Yeah, let's just say limits. some of them, but not all of them. But some of them have a charge, but not all of them. Just a little bit. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. The, the good thing about this, though, is this paper comes out and actually um, adds some constraints to dark matter and physics and in physics constraints are great because it narrows uh narrows where you look for the energetic signal signal of the of a particle and so they have um, used uh, supernovas and slack particle accelerators to come up with a mass um for these and they and they and they say that they've, they've come up with the charge that suggests it's about a million times smaller than the charge on an electron and they call it a mini charge mm. mini charge and uh and and they say most of the parameters parameter space that we are considering is below this thermal relic line thus requiring new interactions to allow the dark matter to annihilate efficiently we leave this challenge for future model building of the needed dark sector anyway future model builders your work is cut out for you 
Yikes. And my final story related to dark matter, which is, again, pretty cool. We know that fusion occurs when atomic nuclei crash into each other. Atoms fuse, nuclei fuse. You have a new element. There's energy released in the process. Researchers said, well, if we've got baryonic matter and we've got dark matter, couldn't this happen to dark matter too? Couldn't there be dark matter fusion when dark matter particles run into each other? And so uh, researcher Sam McDermott published a paper in the June 1st issue of Physical Review Letters. And if the idea is correct, the proposed phenomenon may help physicists resolve a puzzle related to dark matter, which is uh, poorly... And scientists can't really explain how galaxies stars move the way that they do, but some of the quirks of how dark matter is distributed within galaxy centers uh, remain a mystery. That's all related to dark matter. And so potentially how dark matter clumps together is of import. Why wouldn't it? Why would we assume yeah. that dark matter wouldn't interact with itself if it doesn't interact with regular matter? It definitely should. Well, yeah. <laughs> or else it still assuming it's matter matter it's Place strange yeah. it is strange that's dark matter for you <laughs> strange it's that but ah, hmm. <laughs> it's still a placeholder for a thing we don't know it's i mean yeah, yeah absolutely it's our fudge factor there we go yeah. now we know that our fudge factor has a charge and might do yeah. things with each other it may not be the wimps out there, but uh, there's there's definitely something out there. Yeah. So anyway, dark matter, some cool, interesting studies pushing the the envelope of what we understand about it, and maybe giving us more room to question and learn more. Yeah. Justin, what did you bring? So uh, I brought the one of the unknowns apparently in modern science is why the expansion of the universe appears to be accelerating. Why are things going quicker out there? Some scientists argue it's due to dark energy, also a placeholder, that counteracts the pull of gravity <laughs> in theory. While others think Albert Einstein's long accepted theory of gravity itself may need to be modified, there are less of these people. Um, as astrophysicists look for answers and data gathered from astronomical observations, they are finding inconsistencies. And when you have inconsistencies, ooh, you have a place to drill down further, right? Uh, Quotey voice. This is like a detective story where inconsistent evidence or testimony could lead to solving the puzzle, says Dr. Mustafa Ishak Bushaki, professor of astrophysics in the School of Natural Sciences and Mathematics at the University of Texas at Dallas and lifelong member of the Guys with Awesome Names Society. <laughs> Ishak Bushaki and his doctoral student, Wee Kang Lin, have developed a mathematical tool that looks for quirks in cosmological data. And this data is gathered by different scientific missions and experiments. And they just sort of took that data and said, let's see if it's all agreeing with itself. Uh, most recent research was presented June 4th at the meeting of the American Astronomical Society in Denver. Quoting voice again, the inconsistencies we have found need to be resolved as we move toward more precise and accurate cosmology. The implications of these discrepancies are that either some of our current data sets have systematic errors that need to be identified and removed, or that the underlying cosmological model we are using is incomplete or has problems. Astrophysicists use a standard model of cosmology to describe the history, evolution, structure of the universe. For this model, they can, uh, from this model, they can calculate the age of the universe, how fast it's expanding. This model includes equations that describe the ultimate fate of the universe. Uh, what is the ultimate fate of the universe, Jason? Uh... Is, it the, is it the big crunch or is it the, is the, is it the go off into cold darkness? and? What day of the week is it? Everybody bring a sweater. <laughs> bring a sweater. Yeah. Bring yeah. a sweater and a That's towel. Cold crunch. Yeah. It, you know. So, okay. So there's several variables called cosmological parameters. These are embedded in the model's equations, numerical values for the parameters determined uh, from actual observations. And that include things like how fast galaxies move away from each other and the densities of matter, energy, radiation in the universe. But there's a problem with those parameters. Their values are calculated using data sets from different experiments. And sometimes these values, as they discovered here, do not agree with each other. 
how can it be that the actual universe doesn't agree with the actual universe that somebody else is looking at? Uh, so, Cody voice again of Ashik Bushaki. Our research is looking at the value of these parameters and how they're determined from various experiments and whether there's agreement on the values. So what they uh, they looked at, they use, they've got this thing that they've got their, their, their index of inconsistencies is what they've called their, their, their system. The IOI, index of inconsistency, gives a numerical value to the degree of discordance between two or more data sets. So comparisons with the IOI uh, greater than one are considered inconsistent. Those with uh, over five are strongly inconsistent. Example, the researchers used uh, their system to compare five different techniques for determining the Hubble parameter, which is related to the rate at which the universe is currently expanding. One of those techniques referred to as the local measurement relies on measuring the distance to relatively nearby stuff. Uh, this is going to be within our galaxy. Supernova using that right, that expected light uh, candle candle uh, rating for it. Another time, X rely on observations of different phenomena at much greater distances. Cody voice again. We found that there is an agreement between four out of five of these models, but the Hubble parameter for the local measurement of supernova is not in agreement. It's like an outlier. In particular, there's clear tension between the local measurement and that from the Planck science mission, which characterized the cosmic mm. microwave background radiation. So when we look around in the you know Milky Way, things seem to be one way. We go out further, eh, not so much. It's getting a different. So whatever's taking place, it could be that we're in a bubble. Uh, of the Hubble ex expansion of the universe, right? Like it mm -hmm. could, there could be some sort of strange of affect of a local uh, versus a, a far away. Maybe, maybe, maybe galaxies protect. Who knows? Uh, but he goes on. Why does this local measurement of the Hubble parameters stand out in significant disagreement with Planck? Well, he, he doesn't have the answer, but but that's oh, what he's looking yeah. at. Yeah. Uh, well, that's it's all what... relative, man. It's like the universe. It's all relative. It like yeah. depends your point of view, man. That's basically okay. You're you're quoting him. Uh, <laughs> this is very intriguing. <laughs> this is telling us the universe, the largest ob observable scale, may behave differently from the universe at intermediate or local scales. Yeah. This leads us to question whether Albert Einstein's theory of gravity is valid, all the way from small scales to very large scales in the universe. Yeah, this is not the first time that this idea has come up, but I think, you know, it's interesting that, you know, again and again, with new data sets and new approaches to observing the universe, that this, this idea of not a, not a homogenous universe, but a heterogeneous mm -hmm. um, universe comes up and we did we know that there are that there is in the structure of the universe that there is clumping because of dark matter that there is spreading because of the dark energy right you know so we've got local clusters and then we've got other stuff that you know that right. and our our local cluster isn't as close to the other the our neighbors because of the dark energy between us right it's pushing us apart and so it, well, and the infuriating thing is know just that's like, happening, but right, so, we know it's happening, but just it's just in what you said. It's it's because of dark energy. It's because of dark matter, and it's because of gravity, which we Three don't understand. You do not understand yeah, the yeah. mechanisms behind. Right? Like this is, the way this I is, picture it, man. Like you're making a smoothie, <laughs> right? And you have all these ingredients, and you only blend it part way, and then oh my god, the blender! It, you knock it over, right? All the stuff hits the floor. The really liquidy stuff starts spreading across the floor really fast. That more clumpy stuff started to clump together in the blender, kind of clumps up, doesn't blend out, doesn't spread out as far no. on the floor as quickly. You know what? Right? You know what it does? It goes splat. Yeah, there you go. That's what we're doing. We're all just going splat. I'm just going splat, man. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, smoothie analogies for the universe. It's fabulous, you know? And I, I, I like to think of the little tracts between areas that connect areas in the universe as those stringy bits of mango. That yeah, there you go. Blended. Yeah, there or go. like a, a protein powder <laughs> clump. Yeah, that's what we are. We're a protein are you, powder Blair, clump. Blair, that's what we are are you go. hungry right now? What's happening? <laughs> No. <laughs> you look at work back like in the second half. Uh so uh the, okay, so this next story uh, I've got here is it, it sounds like something that needs to be disclaimered. It's about an archaeologist who works in Israel, southern Jordan, and Egypt, and he's calling into question the validity of carbon dating. Yeah, people have right. done this. <laughs> oh, red flags. <laughs> ah, yeah. Oh no. Well, but he's not like calling it like way into question. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, uh, this is more about a matter of resolution and 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 detail. So, so right. radio radiocarbon dating is using um, there's a there's a northern hemispheric version, there's a southern hemispheric version. These have these arcs of correctness apparently. I mean, what he did was sounds pretty simple. He went through and did uh, tree rings of really old trees and did the calibration of the radiocarbon dating from those and found uh, they can be off uh, by as much as 20 years to what regular carbon dating would do. Now that 20 years, like, okay, we're talking about you know, a thousand years ago. Was it a thousand years ago? Was it 1,020? Was it 2,020 years ago? Who cares, right? Well, unless you're an archeologist who's trying to reconstruct the history of the times and then 20 years or a hundred years, become very significant in how right. everything relates in telling the story. So yeah. So if you've seen that story and if you've crossed that headline, you go, bah, I didn't know what that story is without reading it. And it's actually pretty interesting. So there there can be there can be sort of localized shifts in in how carbon dating uh, accuracy works. And this was this is a pretty good example that he that he, he found here. Yeah and, and I'm glad you brought up though that this is not like I, you know, I, I've been to the um, AGU meeting where there are special interest groups that bring posters that try and <laughs> report that, you know, dinosaurs and man lived at the right. same time right. because of, you know, problems with carbon dating. And they try, they have, right. they have their own uh, methodologies that they use to try and um, subvert the dominant scientific paradigm. And so it's nice to know that this is not that. This is actually somebody who knows a lot right. about radiocarbon dating, but is just finding the nuance. Yeah, the Stuart Manning is uh, Cornell University. Although the uh, the the title of the the paper may end up on one of those <laughs> those signs, fluctuating radiocarbon offsets observed at the Southern Levant and implications for archaeological chronology debates. It'll mm. probably be on one of those signs. See, a scientist said. Mm. That it's all hogwash, but yeah, yeah. It's just fine tuning. <laughs> Use it; it'll be a reference, hopefully a reference for good ones. Yeah. So basically, the so the end result is to understand it better. Have they have they gotten it to have they figured out a way to make it make the timing more accurate, or are they just bringing? Uh, no, he's what, he, what he's pointing out is that uh, local climate change over in the past can can affect the what what you're looking at. There's a, there's a number of factors. Like one of the things that they found that had different offsets over those years was uh, a spike in climate heat and drought and that sort of thing that somehow affected mm -hmm. the way that the carbon uh, uptake in the organic materials would be, and therefore your your number if you're using the standard, which is sort of the standard is used for like the whole Northern hemisphere, mm -hmm. right? It's gonna be within this range if you've in the Northern hemisphere, if you're Southern hemisphere, which I didn't know, I didn't realize it uh, before reading this, it was a Northern and Southern mm -hmm. hemispheric uh, uh, differentiation between these, the calibration curve. Um, but yeah, you, 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 you cannot rely 100% on the detail there, but it also points out that as he did uh, established calendar dates between 1610 and 1940 uh, with tree rings and and did a, did his calibration off of those you can you can fine tune uh, that that calibration curve of north and south right
Well, whenever possible, we try to use multiple forms of dating, right? Like carbon dating was yeah. de definitely our, what we thought was our most accurate thing, which is why this might be kind of a bummer. But we also have relative dating, which is the thing that I always think about where once you've established kind of a baseline, you know, based on the sediment layers, um, for example, that dinosaurs and humans were nowhere near each other, <laughs> um, just based on where they fall in the fossil layers. So, you know, there's... Could have been right on top. Of, we could have been right on top of some. But, yeah, yeah. But separated by time. I, I get it, by yes, time. Yes, 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 yes. So it's, hopefully, this isn't too difficult or damning to information that we currently have because people try to use multiple forms whenever possible. Yeah. And I just found um, that there is a small difference in the natural atmospheric carbon-14 concentration between the northern and summer southern hemispheres, known as the interhemispheric carbon-14 offset. It's about 40 years, but varies with time. The southern hemisphere has a larger surface ocean area than the northern hemisphere, with greater wind velocities. As a result, more carbon-14 in the southern troposphere is transported to the oceans through air-sea exchange of carbon dioxide and more carbon-14 depleted carbon dioxide from the, uh, from the oceans is transported to the southern troposphere. There you so go. natural carbon-14 levels in the car southern troposphere are therefore usually lower than those in the northern troposphere. Interesting. Yeah. So it has to do with circulation and wind. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You just science that. I did. That came from a uh, from a website from the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization. That's really exciting. That is a fun fact. I'm gonna put in my bonnet for later. Boop. That's really so not only is Australia wait is I can never remember is Australia ahead of us a day? I think that's what it is. Yeah. Yes, they're ahead of us one day now, but they're 40 years behind us in the past. <laughs> yes. Am I, am I <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to keep my <laughs> mouth shut. <laughs> we love hey, our hey, Australian you know, friends. Yeah. They have, a, I have a, there's, uh, I'm sure some of them are nice people. But you know what? <laughs> <laughs> what time is it, Justin? It is not it's time for, part of this. it's oh, not it's Australia not. bashing show. No, no, it's not that time. Yeah, what time is it? My favorite part of the show. Time for Blair's Animal Corner. She loves our creature, great and small. Biped, still a pet, no pet at all. You want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And I'm good for her. What you got, Blair? <gasps> Oh my goodness, we've been talking a whole bunch about things that you cannot see today, but I want to talk about things you can see and the things you see with, it's your eyes. So a recent study from the University of Exeter was looking at guppy eyes because they appear to be used in some of their communications with one another. So for example, eyes are actually structures that are used for communication in a lot of different species. Sometimes they're used as they have fake eyes to make them look bigger. Sometimes animals conceal their eyes to not give away their space or their actual size. And so this is an, a new kind of twist in that. Um, in, for example, in humans, we have the whites of our eyes. They're used um, specifically to help other humans or other animals, as we've talked about in the past, follow gaze. So the reason you know I'm looking right or left is because you can see the whites of my eyes. So that is a clear signal given through coloration in our eyes. With guppies, they do something absolutely which is insane, which is they can actually change the color of their eyes to warn fish when they're feeling aggressive. What? That would be awesome. Yes. So their eyes are normally um, kind of a grayish color, and they actually turn them black when they want to fight and they've what what's crazy about this is that we've talked a bunch on the show about signals of aggression and escalating aggressive behaviors so that animals can size each other up and so a really good example of that is you have deer with these huge racks these huge 
um, antler sets and they're walking around, they're stamping their feet, they're vocalizing, they're doing kind of a head bob and they're actually sizing each other up to figure out who is bigger and better and if they're evenly matched enough that they should go ahead and have a contest or if there should be a clear winner, then the clear loser would back away so that nobody dies, basically. <laughs> so in this case, this is their version of that. The bigger, badder guppy has their eyes turn black, and this is an honest signal. What that means is that larger guppies turn their eyes black when they are in the presence of smaller guppies. Smaller ones do not return the gesture. They know that they are not big enough, and they do not change the color of their eyes. The way researchers figured this out was by actually making robotic guppies with different colored eyes. And they wanted to see what would happen if smaller fish displayed aggression and larger fish were kind of pushed into that space where the smaller imposters had food. And they found that um, the larger guppies usually attacked the smaller cuppy, guppies that had the dark eye coloration, the fake ones, the robots. So, mm. yeah, so they could tell that they were they were kind of bluffing, which is why they have this honest coloration of saying, no, man, really, I'm bigger than you. And they go, okay, fine, good, okay. I'll leave you alone around this food. So this is a new insight into why animals would have more conspicuous eyes, why they would have this color change, um, and why you'd have a behavior where you wouldn't try to cheat. So it's not evolutionarily advantageous to them to try to cheat because they can see right through it. So the way that I'm seeing this, and this is going to sound super anthropomorphic, but is that the, the bigger guppy is going, I know I'm bigger and you know I'm bigger. Back off. <laughs> right? And so it's kind of this acknowledgement of, hey, I know I'm I'm stronger than you, and I'm giving you a chance to leave without us fighting. <laughs> so well, it's also, it's also as long as we're anthropomorphizing. Yeah. It's also kind of nice because it's like that, that awkward moment where somebody's like, are you stink eyeing me? And you're like, obviously not. Yeah. Obviously yeah, yeah. I'm not. Obvi yeah, obviously. Can you see, see my eyes? Yeah. It's not a but thing that I would be doing. It's also similar. I mean, I wonder, this isn't the color of the iris changing as opposed to something like cats who, when they become yeah. aggressive or they're going to attack, their pupils enlarge, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it might be an honest signal as well as letting in more light to allow for a more accurate attack. But. I wonder yeah. how that, yeah, I wonder how that works out with the guppies as well. Yeah. So they're, they're kind of lumping that all together, saying that um, eye signals might not be an involuntary response. This gives us an idea that there's actually a reason for it. And there could be signals being given through that that are being utilized. So pretty interesting. <laughs> It's really interesting. Yeah. And I, I love this idea of, I mean, we've talked before about honest signals in animals and some animals that cheat it where they yes. use the honest signal to kind of get past a barrier and then they're like, ha ha, and they steal food or they do whatever it is. You know, uh -huh. they, they, they break, they've broken the system because yeah. uh, they're the cheaters, but the, the system works because it allows so many people, not people, <laughs> animals <laughs> not to get in a fight. Yeah, absolutely. And so the, the payoff is less mortality from intraspecific competition, right? Yeah. So, uh, but jumping to interspecific competition, um, I have a story about a very little known insect from New Zealand called a cave weta, W E T A. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a crazy looking insect that not a lot of people know about. Um, there's not a lot of research that's been done on them. They have barely been studied since they were discovered in this particular type in the 1960s. So we're still learning a lot. But one of the really crazy things about these guys is that they have extremely long, crazy, just outrageous hind legs. Like, why would anyone need those? And that's what this study is all about. So the University of Auckland did a study looking at these super long hind legs that only the males have. They found just by observing them in 
the areas where they live in these caves, uh, they found that they actually use them to shield females during mating so that other cave inhabitants can't interrupt them. So wow. this is not necessarily another male Weta trying to get in on the action. At least that's not what they observed. I would be interested to hear if that does happen in future observations. But what they saw was quote unquote, nuisance neighbors kind of getting near them and scaring the female off and having these big legs is just like, stay out of the way. We're busy here. Move along, move along. Right. And this is because the cave wettas, they um, spend most of their day in these caves. They cluster in groups. And when they pair up, they actually meet for hours and mate many times over a day. The longest pairing that they've observed so far was 11.7 hours. Wow. So if uh, the female gets scared off early into that process um, and she scuttles off into a cave, that male might never see her again. That might have been his only chance in a lifetime to mate. And if he doesn't get that quality quantity time in might not father any babies which is you know the the name of the game so this is very interesting that this is a it's a protective anatomical structure to kind of create a a sphere of of influence uh, a sphere of influence a sphere of safety <laughs> Um, it, he, so this, yeah, this is one of the first things I've, it's I've seen about <laughs> he's man spreading. <laughs> yeah, for sure. To, to protect a female during mating. This is something I haven't seen a lot of. And y'all know I've looked into, uh, copulatory techniques of the, of the wild and crazy quite a bit. So this is, this is really cool. I think it's really awesome. Instead of, um, turning, to the potentially nasty in trying to physically restrain, which is how animals usually do this kind of thing. He's just protecting her, just going, stay away, stay away. We're busy. You get away. We're busy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's just like he's not an orb spider. Yeah, because then he'd be eight. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and very last, what? I did want to talk today about the precious, precious sea cucumber. So cucumbers, not for the salads, but the ones related to sea stars, echinoderms, that live in the ocean. Sea cucumbers, they were one of my favorite animals that I worked with when I worked at an aquarium. Because oh, they're so dynamic. God. They what? really are. They're so you you they're so squishy and fun to touch. And then you pull them out of the water and they kind of firm up and they feel completely different. And they have these spikes that look really spiky, but you touch them and they're really soft and they can change their um, kind of the landscape of their body, all this kind of stuff. Um, also, I love talking about how they eat poop, which is actually the really important thing that, that brings the story to us this week is that they are in a lot of ways, the janitors of the deep sea. <laughs> But they also have a really important job to do that we just discovered this week. So um, this is a study looking at sea cucumbers off the coast of Fiji. And um, this was out of the University of Bremen and uh, in partnership with the Wildlife Conservation Society. They were looking at sea cucumbers and their effects on the habitats that they're directly in. So we know in the kind of the grand scheme of things, they're helping clean up the ocean. Um, you know, they're pooping out what is essentially just sand. So they're doing a really good job overall for the ocean. Um, but in these specific areas around Fiji, they are harvested in great number because they're a delicacy. People eat sea, cu sea cucumbers there. They're known as beche de mer or many other names. Um, but so these guys, because they're harvested, people think that they're just these kind of floppy sea noodles that there must be a bunch of them. They're not that important. A lot of people don't even know they're alive or that they're animals. They grab them, they cook them up, they sell them. But what, what we're looking at is what exactly that's doing to the habitat. And so this is a study on um, this coast off of Fiji between September 2015 and February 2016. What's really interesting about that is that it encompassed the El Nino event during that time. 
They created 16 different plots with treatments, which had different densities of sea cucumbers. So you can imagine them scuba divers trying to move around sea cucumbers into these different quadrants. And they were, um, they had different- uh, Sea cucumber wrangling. Yes, exactly. They, they had different um, concentrations of sea cucumbers. So they had one that was considered harvesting, one that was considered over harvesting, and then uh, control. When plots with high densities of sea cucumbers, oxygen conditions in the sediments were stable even during the El Nino event. But when they had removed sea cucumbers from the area, the penetration of oxygen into surface sediments decreased by 63%. Uh -huh. So in this case, sea cucumbers not only just generally make the ocean healthier, but they actually helped handle the increase in organic matter from rainfall and flooding. So that's what's happening is you're you're kind of pushing all the sediment, all this land yuck into the ocean, right? And then you have to process that. And that can actually create an anoxic environment potentially. <laughs> and so yeah. these sea cucumbers start eating all that stuff in overdrive and they are able to maintain a healthy environment through that fluctuation. So these guys are very hardy, but they're also helping keep the reef hardy. So now we know sea cucumbers are an important source of livelihood for tropical coastal communities. And so the fact that they're harvested and fished is a potential problem. There's not a lot of sea cucumbers that are protected or endangered or um, regulated in their harvesting. So this is an animal that definitely deserves an extra bit of protection and focus as we move forward and we have this changing turbulent ocean that we really depend on all over the world so. yeah which brings me to a story about the cassin's auklets Ooh, auklets yeah unfortunately there was recently in the last few years there was massive massive die-off of these auklets along the west coast of the United States in the fall of 2014, across the uh, beaches from California all the way up to British Columbia. Uh, these little seabirds that are pretty cute. Cassin's auklets are adorable little birds. They're dead birds all over the beaches. Nobody was nobody understood why. They were picking up like tens of thousands of them. And um, you talk about uh, anoxic conditions in the ocean. They can be uh, exacerbated by uh, organic material in, uh, in the water. But a, a, another thing that can trigger it is hot water, water that doesn't move very much. Um, and so along, at this period of time, we had been reporting also on this blob, the blob that was just parked off of the west coast of the United States in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and really what happened, there were anoxic conditions, the food, the little plankton and other prey species that these little seabirds like to feed off of or, or the little fishes that the uh, that feed on the planktonic species, they, they all died off. And so the Cassin's auklets didn't have any food. And so there's a new paper that's just come out in geophysical research letters, an international team of about 20 researchers from federal, state, and provincial agencies, universities, and wildlife organizations. Um, they've come together and published, and their data was collected with the help of about 800 citizen scientists who did the reporting on uh, the birds that were found along the coast. Uh, the senior author, Julia Parrish, says this paper is super important for the scientific community because it nails the causality of a major die-off, which is rare. And this major die-off, it really is, It was there's something wrong in the ocean. There's something wrong. Uh, it's, this, is, this is climate change that mm -hmm. caused this die-off. Um, Parrish added, when we see these mass mortality events, that's the ecosystem saying in big neon letters that something is wrong. This paper can be used as definitive proof of the impacts of a warming world. It's not a pretty picture. Uh, and beyond the Cassin's auklets, auklets after uh, the initial period of the auklets dying, there were additional species of birds that were found uh, that died in very large numbers as well. So it wasn't only the auklets, it was um, other seabirds that uh, were included as well. But the auklets were the, the canary on the beaches. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. 
bad news. And maybe if there were more sea cucumbers. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> it's all of these, it's all of these factors that tie together, really, you know, that, uh, you know, you've got uh, the, our misunderstanding or just not understanding how species tie into the ecosystem, how the cucumber is so important. I mean, who, I wouldn't have thought that, that it would yeah. be so important, you know? Yeah. That's why it's back to my old soapbox conversation over and over is save habitats, not species, right? So one of the best things that you can do for the ocean is support the establishment of marine protected areas, because the more marine protected areas we have, people can't fish in that space. People can't dump in that space. And they're actually, uh, We've reported on the show about how more marine protected areas, it's actually safe havens for species to go during periods of stress. So the more space we can set aside, the more habitats we can um, maintain for these natural ecosystems to exist, the, the, the better chance we have. Yeah. And for the, when I Googled sea cucumber, yeah, uh, the first website that came up, was healthy eating sfgate.com. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> about eating them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They're yeah. not healthy eating. Go get a cucumber from the garden. Yes. Don't get a cucumber from the sea. And then I take a trip to your local aquarium and touch a sea cucumber under the water. I think great. you just need to tell people that cuc sea cucumbers eat poop. And <laughs> there you go. That's yeah. Like that may be a PR self defense. Well, mechanism except people still eat crabs and mussels and clams and snails and all poop eaters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we have to have the bottom of the food chain that cleans up after us. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it ends up being a very messy world. That's true. It does. We got to we got to maintain it. All this ecosystem complexity. Oh, uh, quick stories at the end here. We've talked before about prions, misfolded proteins that cause uh, brain wasting diseases like mad cow, Kreutzfeldt, Jacobs, Kuru Kuru and the like. Um, well, researchers have created them. In the lab. Why? Why would you want to do that? Why? So you can study them, of course. That's it. Yes, that is exactly it. I mean, I was going to joke. I was going to ha ha to take over the world. No, they're not. This was published in Nature Communications, and the study is titled Artificial Strain of Human Prions Created in Vitro. In vitro, meaning in a dish or in a, in a tube. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the senior study investigator, Jiri Safar, says this accomplishment represents a watershed. Until now, our understanding of prions in the brain has been limited. Being able to generate synthetic human prions in a test tube, as we have done, will enable us to achieve a much richer understanding of prion structure and replication. This is crucial for developing inhibitors of their replication and propagation throughout the brain, which is essential for halting prion-based brain disease. Um, now, prions are misfolded versions of normal proteins. These proteins are found in the, the cell membranes of neurons throughout the body, throughout the brain. This, they're normal, normal proteins, but something goes wrong. And then when they become misfolded, they get sticky and they become contagious and they, they cause other prions to misfold. Mm -hmm. So. Sticky. Yeah. And so it's very important that we, I mean, it's under, it's important to understand what they are normally, what happens when they go wrong and how we, and, and how we can stop them from going wrong, from going awry. And so this is great research. It'll be fantastic. And then my final story it has to do with dogs because we love dogs, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Dogs are fantastic. Well, they have lots of flu viruses. Oh no. Yeah. Disgusting creatures. Disgusting doggies. Uh, published in M Bio of yesterday, June 5th, about 15% of pet dogs that went to the vet because of respiratory infections carried flu viruses that are often found in pigs. So not doggy viruses, but pig viruses. And we know that many human flu viruses come from pigs. And so the concern now is that dogs could be vectors for pandemic flu. 
Okay, so calling at once. So really, what this means is, if I had a dog, which I do not currently, but I will someday soon, I'm sure. If I had a dog and it was sneezing a lot, I would take it to the vet, and if it had the flu, then I it would not get to lick my face or sleep in my bed until it felt better. Right. It It'd should. Be fine. Yes, you should take <laughs> all the precautions. Um. So the the. A lot of the time, you know, dogs have dog flu viruses. There are very specific dog flu vi viruses that do not replicate and infect humans. Um, they, do, you know, they're not transferable, but some of them are potentially. And so uh, the first flu virus in dogs was discovered in 2005 in the United States. And it was from a horse flu virus called H3N8 that jumped from horses to dogs. And um, it can it's like a shelter flu that can spread between dogs. And in 2010, some dogs in Asia were found with a version of H3N2 that comes from birds. And so we also know that cats can catch this H3N2 from dogs, but then don't transmit it. And so in this new study from 2013 to 2015, uh, they found that some of the dogs had various swine H1N1 flu viruses, which are infectious. So mm -hmm. this is, you know, it's a it's an issue. A lot of the viruses that the dogs have will not transfer to humans, will not transfer to any other species, but the potential is there uh, for, you know, dogs. If it if it is making the jump from pigs to dogs it can potentially make the jump then from dogs to humans and could be, it could be disastrous, but you know, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, don't go licking your dog if your dog has a cold, what seems to be an infection, right? Yes. Mm. And no Blair Baz, as you're saying in the chat room, this is not a witch hunt. <laughs> <laughs> I see your commentary. I know. I know. No, no, it's, it's good to know. Zoonotics are very important, and if anyone in, in this chat should know about it, it's I. When I worked with the primates, I had to wear a mask every day because things could pop, hop from me to the primates or from the primates to me. It's very important to yeah. be aware of. So, yes, let your dog lick your face, but only if they're feeling okay. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any quick stories for the end here? Uh, I got three quick stories here. Uh, I'll just post the stories in the uh, on the online uh, aspect of the show. Uh, three stories. One uh, is they're all to do with global warming. One tropical cyclones or hurricanes, if you're in the civilized part of the world, uh, are moving slower over land and water. Oh, great! Hurricanes are moving slower. That means that it's less of a problem, right? No. It actually means they stay over the thing with they're causing havoc to longer. When they go on land, they drop water in a location longer. And uh, globally, it's kind of significant in different places. Australia is seeing 15% slower. I think they have the tropical storm variety down there. Uh, North Atlantic, uh, the ones that are hitting the, you know, the United States with some frequency, 6% slower. So not so bad. Western North Pacific, so this is like uh, China and Japan region of ocean, 20% slower than they did over times past. Thanks. Uh, the National Oceanic, uh, what's it, uh, folks, discovered that May <laughs> last month, uh, this is the quick part of the story. Got to say the whole thing. NOA, uh, May. You can say NOAA. No, no, what's it? But it's always got the kind of NOAA. Uh, is announced that uh, last month, May, 5.2 degrees above the 20th century's average for that month uh, across the United Aww. States. Who the heat is on? But but there are uh, there is good news. Um, and uh, the third story uh, looked at high tide flooding that happens across the United States. Um, oh wait, no, maybe I read it wrong. It's twice the rate it was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's oh. not good news. No, that's not good no. news. I read the it's, headline. You know, so I, thought, I was like, oh, it's twice. Like, that's something better. It's twice as good news. Yeah. But it's no. It's, if I can say one like, thing that about this, it's that when, when I read all of the Yale studies about people's uh, current perspective on climate change, the thing that is always so frustrating to me and, and the thing that's the 
in many ways, the most important thing that we get out there is that people believe it exists and it's happening, but they don't believe it's happening to them or will happen to them in their lifetime. And it is so happening now. it's happening right now. Oh, so, so the only thing we can hope filing it away with one day the sun will explode. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so so my only hope in all of this is that when the these proverbial sea cucumbers start hitting the fan here, we can <laughs> say look it's happening right now like let's can we can we mitigation and adaptation right now let's go like come on yep let's do what we can everybody and there's yep. a lot that we can do we can all work together we can all have our voice in local government i know there were recent elections yesterday in many places i hope everyone got the vote out we want to see mm -hmm. you guys get out there and uh use your voice um, but, you know, we can all we can all do what we can in our local communities and, you know, act local. What is it? Act local. Think global. Think, think global. Act local. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Think mm -hmm. global. You know, mm -hmm. we can, it affects it. It has those butterfly effects, the things that you do. I always thought that was always backwards. Though. I always think it should be. Well, think locally and act globally. <laughs> it's pretty hard for your average Joe to act globally when you don't have, I don't yeah, know, a podcast that's uh, that's broadcast in many countries. So we're acting globally right now. But that's right. That's right. You know, even a, a second I, grader can can I'm act locally. Important. I am learning. thinking very locally. Thinking locally. Um, in fact, so locally, I might go somewhere very close very soon. <laughs> So that's the cue for and that is the cue, everyone. I think we have made it to the end of another episode. Thanks everyone for joining us. I would like to thank all of you in the chat rooms in the various places, our our main chat room, our YouTube chat room, our Facebook chat room. Thank you so much for chatting and having a conversation while we kept while we did the show. And I hope you enjoyed your experience. And to everyone who helps us make this show possible, thank you for your assistance. Fata, thank you for your help on social media and your help moderating the YouTube chat room and for your help uh, making the YouTube comments or the YouTube description for every episode. That's a lot of work, I know. Identity4, thank you for your help in recording the episode and getting me those files every week. And Brandon, Thank you for helping us simulcast to Facebook. Without you, we wouldn't be there. So everyone, thank you so much. Those of you on Patreon who are supporting us, I would really like to thank you. Thank you to Paul Disney, G. Burton Lattimore, Richard Onimus, Ken Hayes, Harrison, Pr Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Andy Groh, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Stoney Steele, Ed Dyer, Craig Landon, John Swamy. Mark Mazaros, Jack, Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K, Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Kyle Washington, Eric Knapp, Richard, Brian Condren, Aiden Jeff, Kevin Reardon, Dave Neighbor, Christoph Zuknierek, Noah Zemke, Jim C. Wright, Ashish Pants, Jacqueline Boyster, Ulysses Adkins, Sean Bryant, Sarah Chavez, Richard Boyder, Artyom, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa, Sl Lisa Slazuski, Drim Jepo, Jake Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Ben Rothig, Steve Lesseman, Kurt Larson, Robert Aston, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie Gary S. Robert, Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin Flying Out, Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, about Kesson Flo, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, EO, Mark, Tyrone Fong, and Keith Corsell. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And those of you who may be interested in uh, in finding out more about Patreon, you can do that at twist.org or just at patreon.com slash this week in science next week's show second week of june already oh my goodness it will be we will be back broadcasting live online 8 p.m pacific time on twist.org slash live you can watch and join the chat room uh if you can't make it you can also find everything in the past it's all archived at twist.org slash youtube at twist.org or at facebook.com slash this week in science Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have a mobile type device, you can look for Twist, the number four Droid app in the Android Marketplace, or simply This Week in Science in anything Apple Marketplace. -y. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts or other listeners. 
Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMeaning at Gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBands at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at TwistScience, at Dr. Kiki, at JacksonFly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in science, science, science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from Jeopardy. Jeopardy! And this week in science is coming away. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 this week in 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 science. And we're back with the after show of This Week in Science.
Oh, Kiki's still muted. Yeah. I did mute myself so I could go away. Did you guys listen to the white noise? Uh, white noise? No. What are you talking about? Okay, good. Just looped around. there. I've got, there's like white noise in this list here. Oh, but there's exclamation marks next to it. Good. You guys may have just been sitting here listening to white noise. <laughs> no, the second, the second song came on again. <laughs> That's good. I was like, I gotta go. I'll be <laughs> back. See you guys later. This is the after show. Woohoo! We were talking ahead of uh, the show. There's some tiredness in the in the crew this evening. Yes, for so, sure. Yeah, I think I need a new bed. Is the problem? What you got a new bed? No, no I need, need a new bed. Oh. Well, I hear that uh, Trump Tower sells used hotel mattresses. Ew. <laughs> Well, the head of the EPA was, for some reason, looking into buying. Have you guys not heard this story? Oh no, it's his. The, he wasn't he trying. It's like payola or something. He's trying to. He was trying to use his position to get his wife a mattress franchise. That, no, no, no. That was a uh, a Chick Fil A franchise. Chick Fil A. This was this is a side story that he sent okay. somebody who worked for him to go like look into. He heard you could buy a, a used mattress from the Trump Hotel, and like wanted to. For what reason? One can only speculate. Oh boy. Uh, why somebody would about and things. somebody who's spending like forty thousand dollars on soundproof phone booths is thinking of buying a used hotel mattress. I, <laughs> I would I would suggest not using a black light on those. Yeah. <laughs> but but aside from that, then it does make you sort of think like I wonder if this is some weird sort of payola scheme. Like yeah. Aha, I figured Justin, out how I can funnel every... money from one place to another. I can buy the used mattresses from Trump and for $20,000. Like, it never went anywhere. But it's just like, why in the... It's just such a bizarre... It's, I think it's safe to assume that anything with certain people involved are a payola scheme. <laughs> well, well, yeah, but there's also like Pruitt himself, like the... That whole controversy about the minute he took office, he wanted 24 hour security. Like, it's kind of a tell, right? Like, I'm going to do stuff that I'm pretty sure people are going to want to oh, kill yeah. me for. Well, didn't, for what I'm going to do. Didn't Ben Carson, Carson buy a $100,000 desk or something like that? Uh, uh, Pruitt, I think, got two desks that amounted oh, to that. Uh, he did, yeah. he got like a, a, ta a dining set that. He then blamed on his wife. Well, my wife ordered it. It was her. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> sure. Under the bus. Sweetie, what do you think about this one? Whatever you want, dear. Uh, I'll just charge it to the whatever organization I work for. I forget. I don't know. Oh, right. The United States. Yeah. Uh, someone in the YouTubes was wondering um, if you still, you, you, if you still had a, a spoon holding your microphone together. No. I'm guessing that's anyway. Dave Friedel in there. I don't know. Um, no, I remember Kiki, or you should, I should say, with the donations, Ooh. bought me a new housing unit for my, my microphone. Unit. So, yes. Twist Donations helped me get a mount that did not use duct tape and a plastic knife. Hooray! Yay! Yay. My super awesome boom mic is uh, courtesy of Chris Clark. Uh, That's right. Chris noticed Clark. that I was, I was having uh, severe mic stand issue problem thingies <laughs> and and uh, direct mail it to me. It was yeah. pretty awesome. Now, Justin yeah. and I just need new cameras so he doesn't go black at certain moments, his entire screen, and I don't turn into this washed out banshee. Well, you could be blue like me. I could get, I could get you this camera. This camera is amazing. I would go with that look. I think that's pretty good. Yeah. It's pretty. It's, it has the thing is, fantastic. my yeah. eyes have adjusted to it, and now you look normal to me. Really? But that's, well, I'm but you're daddy, do, 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 so yeah, that colorblind. When she first, when she first logged on, I was like, oh, "You're blue," 
But right now, looking at her, I'm like, mm, you look normal. Yeah. You also thought the crosswalk uh, icon yes, person green. was green. Was green. Yeah. I still, still to this day, I'm like, oh, the green walkie guy. She's off. totally colorblind. So she just assumes green means yeah. go. So when that lights up, oh, that must be what green this looks like. This is the real thing. I didn't know that I was wrong until I watched a video about colorblindness that someone sent me that's like, is this what it's like for you? They were just curious. And one of the people in the video said, oh, yeah, I always thought that the walking guy was green and someone told me it was white. And I lost my mind. I was like, it is not. And I started like Googling, like, what color is the walk sign on the they're like, yeah, it's a white. It's a white stick figure. I'm like, what? What? I never knew that. All these years. It's well, it's yeah, it's like I'll I'll usually I go shopping with a friend or I'll ask like the person in the store, like what color is this? What color is this? So usually when I buy a new article of clothing, I know what color it is leaving the store and I remember it. But every once in a while I'll go to Goodwill or I'll do something where I'll buy a piece of clothing and we I'll just wear it for it months is. and months and months. And then I'll be like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I really like this shirt cause it's purple. And you know, I do really like per and someone's like, Nope. No. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Try again. <laughs> hey, Jason, I got a question. How much? How much uh, of the squiggly line interpretation is is becoming like computer learning assisted? That's a good question. Um, so many people are are developing routines to if if you were to get say a thousand spectra in of something you can develop routines to sort of ai sort through them uh to pull out the unique ones or the more most interesting ones um but how much is how many uh, i mean I, so is that so then it's not so much it's not so much that you can plug the data into the computer and the computer says oh this is this this is this it's more like Here's a unique pattern that the uh, scientists should put their eyes on versus we kind of can rule these ones out as being noise or? Well, I mean, for, so for me, I, when I get a spectrum down and I want to know what's in there, and if it's not an obvious thing, it's, it, you turn to modeling. You try to reproduce the, the spectrum with known quantities, known, known values for a methane or whatever. And uh, make a make a best match. Can a can a computer do an AI sort of thing? Uh, I don't know. Uh, a friend of mine, she she does clustering, so it sort of takes spectra and finds finds the unique which 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 averages. So if you have a whole field of spectra, which ones average together to make make unique um, signals, and you can kind of tweak what you mean by unique, I guess. tweak the unique yeah because like yeah. for for most and uh you know most of us you know the visit to to pluto is over right that happened it's the, now things are going but the the data <laughs> from that right, right, or, or never heard of it but but the data from that is uh is pretty voluminous i mean you you still have like one of the it's one of the interesting things i think about when I, all the like seeing any of these projects or even even data that we're getting from telescopes uh that data that's collected doesn't get gone through you know during the project or, but it can sometimes be years and years mm -hmm. after that there's still data to what what is it what's what's job security look like uh for a position like this i mean like in terms of like like could you run out of work without the next uh, the next mission? Uh, you're more likely to run out of money before you run out oh, of work. Right. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, you, you, there's, there's so much data out there. There's, if you could think of something to, that you want to look for, search or compare to, or do something with, you know, there, it's there. It's getting, say, usually, usually we apply to NASA for certain programs, uh, trying to Trying to convince a, a group of fellow scientists that your that your idea is worthy of a couple hundred thousand dollars of, of money and a few years of time. And is it and is it um, so? Here's a, like, can you get access yourself 
uh, as a scientist in this field without being funded to go look for the thing that's interesting to study? Or is it, or you have to get the, the grant to even start the, the, the searching? That, that's the fun thing is that anyone with a little bit of know-how can go through the NASA archives because NASA is a government program and we pay for it with our tax money. So the, the data we get from New Horizons or Cassini or Voyager or whatever, it's all on a database, the planetary uh, PDS, planetary data systems, I guess what it stands for. Um, and anyone who has the patience to sort through it can find what they're looking, you know, find certain observations. Um, it could be just imagery and you can play with images to make them look nice. Or there could be squiggly line stuff or some other value. And my, my, uh, my backdrop is courtesy of NASA. Yeah. I, I, I didn't really think you were on the moon. <laughs> well, I could, yeah. And it would have been really difficult for me to go there and take this picture on my own. That's so. true. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. And lots of people do uh, the uh, make beautiful Jupiter right now with the Juno mm. mission, the data oh, that's yeah. coming from. Yeah. There are a few people who are taking that data and colorizing it and, you know, tweaking it. And it, oh, my gosh, beautiful images coming out of that. Yeah. I, I don't know how, many, how much people realize that when, you know, when we have these missions going on, our images actually come back as black and white. And we put, you know, we, we look at our objects through certain filters. And then we try to represent what our naked eye would see when we combine all these images to make a, a color picture. But because we can do that, we can tweak, tweak how the colors come out or contrast comes out. And so Juno, because it's got the latest technology, the best cameras, and we're flying really close to, to Jupiter, has really returned imagery that is borderline art, art science yes. art, whatever. Yeah, um, I mean, I the mean, swirly storms to, just yeah. blow you away. Yeah, I mean, the 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 Jupiter of my childhood, it's like forever changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very true. Yeah. Yes, Sean Doran, Richard Hendricks, you said, uh, is, has, has brought up Sean Doran in the YouTube chat room. Yes, Sean Doran, I think, has some of the best images out there. You can find him on Twitter. You can find him all over the place. Oh, yeah, LJ. Uh, NASA has a big announcement tomorrow. Again, giant announcement that... Do you know what it is? No, I don't. I actually don't. <laughs> uh, thank you, Blake. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we got to find... So the, the big... They, they've got a drill going again on the Curiosity rover. Oh, yeah. So maybe this has something to do with something that came back as a result of the drill getting going. Um, you know, this well, is- they, did, they successfully drilled. And then they, I think wasn't the challenge like, okay, now how to get it into the analyzer? Yes. And if yeah. they did that, maybe they have they a result. Yeah. Um, yeah, which would be cool. And, but I mean, it's, a, they've the reason it's, they're, I think they're doing their embargo on Thursday is that uh, they're publishing in, in nature. So it's a big paper being, pub being published in nature. It's going to be something big, but mm. I don't know. I mean, they're not teasing it as much as like, I don't know. Sometimes People you don't want to go too far. I hope they don't. I mean, they've gone too far many times. Uh, uh, according to Google, it's a new discovery from Mars. That's it. Yeah. It's not going to be life on Mars. Right, there once. right. Didn't we hear that already? <laughs> a few times. <laughs> a few times. Yeah. Okay. It's a nature uh, paper. It's got to be good. According okay. to Science Alert, NASA is about to announce a massively exciting Mars discovery. Massively <laughs> exciting. That was what I saw about it's not aliens. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but wait, but that would be, well, yeah, that would be, that would be probably coined differently than massively exciting, but it would, that would be interesting. At 2 p.m. Eastern time, which is 11 a.m. Pacific Western time. Eastern. Yes. Which means <sighs> perfect timing. I'll be back from my kickboxing class. I will be showered and ready to sit down and tweet it up with everyone else i will watch it tomorrow you guys so i'll be i will i will be online talking about it tomorrow 
and we'll see what it is at 11 a.m. Um, yeah, I don't think it's going to be life, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, next week, I, I have tickets to go see Janelle Monet on Wednesday. Huh? <laughs> I have concert tickets on Wednesday. Go have fun. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think I'm gonna go to go see Janelle Monet because she's amazing. Yeah. Yes. You deserve it. Thank you. When are you going? It's a Wednesday night concert. We have all the great acts wait, in wait, the wait, Portland wait, area, wait, but they never uh, are on nights that are convenient. It's either a Monday. Which I'm like, it's Monday night. I'm tired. You want me to go Wait, when to is concert this? tonight? Next when is Wednesday. This? Next Wednesday. So is it? It starts at what? 10? 11? What? No. No. It's an, oh, it's an afternoon concert. It's over it's by six. Eight. No. Then I don't understand what no. you're saying. No. Or what that could possibly. No. And it's at the edge field, which means. They, oh, the they have good field. Wi-Fi. Nope, which no, means they... I have to go there and stand in line forever. And... Oh, yeah, don't do that. That would be terrible. <laughs> You're right. Totally not worth leaving the house on a Wednesday night of all times. Now, I'll give everyone a concert review. I will go on. I will, I'll, be, I'll be watching and reporting on the NASA announcement tomorrow, along with everybody else. Um, and yeah, I, I'll be doing other things. Next week, next week, my good. If I can get tickets for the whole chat room, hot <laughs> rod. Yeah. Then Justin and I'll just be talking to nobody. <laughs> you know what? You know what, Blair? What? We're going to be talking about NASA's new discovery oh, without me. Life being found on Mars. No. Well, while Kiki's at a what was the name of the, the band again? Janelle Monet. Janelle, the Janelle Monet band. You. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Old man. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I was old even when I was young. I've, <laughs> I've never, I've never been a young person. I've never been a young person. I don't, I don't know what the best life to be a young person. I've never been young. Someday I dream of being young. No. Yeah, but I, I, oh, I, leave, uh, I leave everyone in very capable hands for next week. Blair and Justin. They're going to have... <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> Free for all show. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, luckily, I found some stories I wanted to report on this week, but I had too many, so I tentatively dumped them in the show notes for next week. And awesome. since Kiki won't be here, I'll need extra stories anyway, so it all works birds, out. I have bird, a couple of bird stories to send you again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Give me yes. all the bird stories. Bird. I have a fun one about bird sperm that I might talk about next week. Ooh, That's a cattail. Cattail. <laughs> Come here, Stella. Hi. Whoa. What are you doing? Hello, Stella. No, get off my computer. Ah, there we go. Ugh. We're all here together. How come I can't find out what the announcement's going to be before they announce it? So embargo. People take embargoes seriously. Sure do. Mm-hmm. We don't talk about news before it is news. Or else nobody will let you talk about the news again. Hmm. Don't break the embargo. Is that why I've never been able to get behind the embargo wall? Because I'm like, I want to know what it is now. Right. They don't trust you. Uh, <laughs> no way. Okay. Makes sense. Well, they're doing it right. <laughs> Ooh, haha, -ha, identity four. And any in the chat room says, leaving us in capable hands. Ooh, is Tom Merritt guesting? <laughs> Ooh, very rude. Very <laughs> rude. But apt. Uh, yes. Apt, <laughs> but rude. <laughs> Maybe I'll just give him a call. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking. Um, 
I do, I do like inviting people for, for guessing. It's wonderful to have, it's nice to have open slots like this to have people like Jason to come on and talk about their current research. But if you guys, um, I would love some help brainstorming some uh, names for people to interview. If oh. You um, a, if you can send me a list of names. I told you one that I mentioned like a bunch of times. I know and I forgot again. <laughs> and write it down. You want me to make a list? That's the point of me giving you a list if you don't write it down once you get the list. <gasps> um, another way will be, will be kind of, we had the uh, vul Vulcanists uh, mm -hmm. a ways while back. Yes. We could, uh, have some have them come on and dispel everybody's fears or create new fears about the uh, <laughs> volcanoes that are yeah. going on. Uh, maybe I, uh, Micah McKinnon. She is a Canadian a woman who is a geophysicist, volcanologist. Maybe she can do that. That would be awesome. Yeah. Myth dispelling. No, just because there's an eruption in Hawaii and there is another one in Guatemala does not mean the entire ring of fire is going to go up in flames. Oh, is Doesn't that what's mean? happening? No. Oh, no. Time to run for the hills. No, wait. Stay away from the hills because that's where my volcanic activities were. Run to the valleys, but that's where the lava is going to head to. I don't really know. Run to the middle of the ocean. Ah, but there's all those soup come to those. Yeah. That, there's nowhere is safe. No, it's the moon. moon. The, the moon. moon. Let's go to the moon. Right. Yeah. Is the moon the moon no longer has volcanic activity? That's right. Some moon quakes. Does it still quake? Uh. Well, it did when Apollo was there. Wow. Okay. Really? I did not know that. Yeah. Oh, I got to look into a story that I saw today that I just I looked at it very briefly and didn't have time to jump. Was into it, it the the baby from Three Parents? No. Oh. <laughs> <Yep. laughs> no which is possible and it's totally fine yeah so there's a whole science it was all over the internet today it's just science it's yeah, okay it was, it was really Nothing fine weird yeah it's totally fine oh um hi stella you guys if you could see my cat she's being really cute right now she's gonna attack me um from inside my sweater so <laughs> <laughs> the story about the moon, some headline uh, was saying that the Apollo astronauts messed up because they uh, they drove around on the surface and they messed up the dust on the surface of the moon. They decreased the light reflection of the moon by one to two percent. No, which. Yeah, no, I need to look into this because it was like a what kind of story. And I was like, I got to get back to this later. Because I was like, it's a moon is big compared to the area that yeah. was possibly yeah. affected by any lunar landing, right? Yeah. Uh, that sounds like some yeah. nonsense. I, yeah. Unless, I unless they're, I, and I mean, I don't know. Well, maybe not. Like, like okay, the the reflection of the area of the tracks where the rover moved, like. Or they uh, that's changed, and therefore some very specifically localized event around where the astronauts were. Is that something like? But I didn't see the story, so I don't know. What I'm talking about. I would imagine the number of impacts that have hit the moon since Apollo has uh -huh. done equally, or if not more, yeah, to kick up the dust, excluding okay. L-cross impact, <laughs> which we did. Okay, wait, hold on. Okay, so this new study, I'll just give a link to the study. Okay, what does it say here? Um, this new study, scientists reported in a new study, they've solved the decades old mystery of why the moon's subsurface warmed slightly during the 1970s. They used lost data tapes that were recovered by scientists and it filled in a record record gap during the 1970s, and they identified the source of warming as the Apollo astronauts themselves. Mm. The astronauts disturbed the moon's surface soil by walking and driving a rover on it. As a result, the moon reflected less of the sun's light back out to space, which raised the lunar surface temperature by one to two degrees Celsius, where it was disturbed. 
it where it was right disturbed. where oh, right, right where. where it was disturbed okay, okay yeah. that localized the event that makes sense there we go okay yeah. all safe <laughs> <sighs> not crazy time okay uh have you ever noticed how like if you look at the dark side of the moon it looks like a different moon what's the dark side no well, dark side. it's not the actual dark side, but it's the, uh, uh, the what is there a word for it? That's like the unrevealed to us side, the far side, the other the side, far the side, other. the far what? side, the, the far, far side. side, far side, the far side of the moon. Yeah, Looks it's like, like a completely like, different moon. It's like it's unrecognizable. Like, what are you doing? Yep. I mean, I so I in the past did work with lunar data, and I've somewhat <laughs> become familiar with the far side of the moon. <laughs> But yeah, it is a completely different place. You, I think I've seen pictures where they'll superimpose the, the far side of the moon with the Earth in the background, and people don't realize it's still the moon because yep. there's <laughs> nothing familiar. But it looks different. Um, yeah, so let's see. The China is going to be checking out the far side of the moon soon. They're Changi. Is it Changi 4? It must be 4. Yeah. Are they getting there? They're checking it out. Changi 3, Changi 4, something like that. China. Crazy. Okay. I like knowing that I'm not, not crazy when it comes to the surface of the moon heating up. <laughs> there's, an, there's an explanation for everything. It's good. Um, are we good to go, you guys? You guys ready for bed? Yes, Fnord, free, free fact. Dark Side of the Moon was a great album. The Far Side was a great comic. And The mm. Far Side was a great, great hip-hop group. Good hip-hop. Huh? It's better with a PH, Far Side. Oh, how hip with a CH. <laughs> ah, you kids today. Never <laughs> learning to spell. Kids. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Far side. P yeah, C Y D E. Mm. Far side. Well, it all the stuff wrong. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it happened. All the sleepy people. Jason's not tired because he he's an astronomer and all astronomers <laughs> have insomnia. <laughs> Little known fact. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Astronomers cool. don't sleep. They're like, why would Little I be out during fact. the day? There's nothing to see. <laughs> yeah. I, I also don't drink coffee when I go observing. No. I don't. I don't drink coffee at all, but like when I go observing, I just drink a lot of water. Then you have to go to the bathroom a lot. So you're not gonna fall asleep. Right. <laughs> well. Yeah, water is better for keeping you awake, actually. Yeah. Being Plus, you're usually at altitude. You need the water. Mm -hmm. yeah. ah. My cat <laughs> crawled in. I'm wearing a cardigan. My cat crawled in one side of the cardigan and has now parked herself inside the cardigan oh, behind me and is attacking my back. Oh, ah! <laughs> cats. She's so sweet. She's like, you need to pay attention to me. Don't pay attention to those cameras and those people over there. Pay attention to me with my sharp claws. You should ask her if you're going to have a behavioral issue with her right now. I'm going to have a behavioral Is that what it was? No. It was I have a close. behavioral issue right now. This is uh, Kiki talking to her young son right before. What was it? Behavioral difficulty. That's what it was. <laughs> It was behavioral no. difficulty. difficulty. It was issue. It was issue. Uh-uh. It remember. was difficulty. I remember it was many syllables. <laughs> Are we going to have a behavioral difficulty right now? Yes. It was great. Uh, this is how. And he looked. He name. looked chastened. <laughs> <sighs> After I spoke sternly to him with oh my globbles. Goodness. He, he appeared chastened and he looked at me like, <laughs> yep, 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 yep. He stopped messing about. He did what I asked him to do. That 
kid. He's like, oh. no, we shan't be having any behavioral difficulties, mm-hmm. Mama. <gasps> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I shall go Blair. retire. Say goodnight, Blair. Go retire. Say goodnight, Blair. <laughs> goodnight, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. Good night, Justin. Good night, Kiki. Good night, Kiki. Sorry. Good night, Jason. Good night. Good night, Jason. Good night everyone. So nice to meet you. Yes, thank you so much. It's been fun, really fun. Yeah. Thank you for joining us on the show tonight. Really enjoyed having you here. Same here. Veritable plutonic font of knowledge. Yeah, I hope everyone has a wonderful week. I will not be here next week, but Twist will be back, so don't miss it. Bye. Bye. Night night. <laughs>